And so, welcome to everybody. Uh, I know that some, many people that uh, announced the, the, their participation are coming because it's a little um, difficult to, to be in the early, early, <laughs> quite early morning with the traffic. And also, Maria Joao uh, Rodriguez, is, she's coming and she will reach us uh, in uh, some minutes. And so, we decided to, to begin because we have a, a very uh, fantastic richness of uh, panelists, uh, and uh, we have also two panels, but we want also to give the floor uh, to participants to have this ping pong uh, style uh, for uh, questions and answers, etc. Oh, uh, luckily, we have also interpretation. Uh, thanks to the interpreters for being here in uh, English, uh, Italian, and French, maybe. No, no, in everybody, in every language. Yes, sorry, sorry, no. No, because yesterday was in another meeting that we organized on the poverty, and maybe for the, for the item we are only three languages. But today, sorry, <laughs> we are in a perfect uh, organization. Uh, and so, uh, profiting of this uh, possibility, I prefer to continue, if you allow me, in uh, Italian. Uh, not only because it's my own language, not only in, in uh, honor of uh, cultural diversity, but also uh, because it's better also for you, because I can express myself in a better way than so. And so I pass to, to, to Italian. You can hear your <coughs> headphone. Mi pare che N, English is uh, two, uh, French is three, Italian four. Uh, German, I don't remember when, but in any case, you can uh, find uh, the right uh, channel. Okay? May? Allora, prima di tutto, grazie a tutti i nostri invitati per essere qui. E grazie ai miei colleghi eh, che sono qua con noi, in particolare alla collega Julie Ward e al, corre e al corre collega Mochil Nekov e al collega Luigi Morgano della Commissione Cultura. Sono colleghi del gruppo SD, voi sapete che questo è un seminario organizzato eh, dal nostro gruppo della Commissione Cultura, Educazione, Giovani e Volontariato e Media, Audiovisivo, questi sono tutti i temi di cui ci occupiamo, e Cittadinanza, e abbiamo dato un titolo abbastanza, come dire, ambizioso, e cioè Education, Culture and Solidarity Citizenship, Reshaping eh, Europe from Here. Eh, perché diciamo questo? Eh, perché noi riteniamo che in questi anni, lo abbiamo cercato di fare seriamente e certamente anche in collaborazione con la Commissione che ringrazio per essere qui, eh, per, eh, in particolare con la DGAC, non tutta la Commissione è sempre stata molto in questa linea, perché riteniamo che la nostra visione eh, sia questa, che il progetto europeo, eh, uno sviluppo sostenibile e una possibilità di riconfigurare una forte identità europea non può ripartire se non eh, da un grandissimo investimento, investimento culturale, investimento di risorse, investimento di politi politico, sul, centrato sulle persone, sulle risorse umane, sull'educazione, sulla cultura, sulla solidarietà. Noi vogliamo dare sostanza a una cittadinanza europea eh, attiva, eh, una cittadinanza europea ma anche una cittadinanza globale, oggi il tema è questo, e eh, soprattutto restituire un senso anche di appartenenza nel momento di crisi del, del progetto europeo all'entità europea e creare le, promesse, le premesse per una società che sia sia inclusiva che innovativa. E le due cose per noi stanno insieme. E soprattutto una prospettiva di uno sviluppo appunto sostenibile. E noi riteniamo che la cultura e l'educazione siano il quarto pilastro dello sviluppo sostenibile. Senza un accesso alla conoscenza e all'educazione, senza la possibilità di, di esprimersi liberamente, culturalmente e dal punto di vista delle proprie competenze e senza la conoscenza anche del proprio patrimonio culturale, materiale e immateriale, la cultura non si rigenera, non è una risorsa, una risorsa infinita. Può bastare una generazione, dico, una butta, la butto lì, di ignoranti per dover ricostruire le basi dell'educazione, della cultura e della solidarietà. E alcuni esempi in Europa, in questo momento, purtroppo, se posso essere sincera, anche nel mio Paese lo stanno dimostrando. Dobbiamo perciò reagire e quando diciamo che oggi l'altra sfida è quella di sostenere e rafforzare il valore intrinseco, non solo ancillare della cultura, non solo perché produce lavoro, perché produce economia, certo, ma prima di tutto è un valore in sé, e lo stiamo recuperando oggi in questo senso, e dell'educazione, come fatto di libertà della persona, di crescita, 
di capacità di gestire eh, diciamo, la sua vita, eh, di interessarsi della comunità, di avere un pensiero critico, no? tanto le fake news eh, ci assillano, e soprattutto di riuscire anche a interpretare una innovazione sociale e culturale. Questo è il senso. E io penso che come gruppo noi in questi anni abbiamo cercato di lavorare in questa direzione, recupero molto velocemente perché voglio fare un'introduzione piuttosto breve, però dirvi qualcosa, insomma, voglio, vorremmo fare questo seminario per due ragioni, fare un po' il bilancio di alcune cose che sono fatte, naturalmente non, non solo il Parlamento, ma in, in, anche in sintonia e spesso anche integrando proposte su tutta la Commissione, questo lo riconosco, ma anche vogliamo fare, dire una cosa, certo parleremo anche dei programmi, hm? Abbiamo quattro programmi importantissimi che noi, diciamo, di cui ci occupiamo in Commissione Cultura, Erasmus, per il quale abbiamo chiesto di triplicare i fondi. Si spegne continuamente il, il mio microfono? Allora, eh, Erasmus, abbiamo la, eh, il programma nuovo che, si chiama, che noi vogliamo che si chiami Cittadinanza, Diritti e Valori, non solo Diritti e Valori, il programma Europa Creativa di cui sono il relatore, il programma eh, sul eh, Corpo Europeo di Solidarietà come autonoma, istituzione, ma noi riteniamo che i programmi sono in funzione delle policies e vogliamo che si parli di più di politiche europee per la cultura, per l'educazione, per il patrimonio culturale, per la solidarietà, per la cittadinanza e per le nuove generazioni, ovvero mettere questi programmi in una visione di costruzione di politiche più audaci, più innovative e di prospettiva, perché l'anno prossimo abbiamo un importante appuntamento. Eh, le elezioni europee, la fine di una legislatura, eh, l'avvio già da quest, da questo, da questi mesi della nuova programmazione pluriennale 21-27 che ha alcuni focus su cui ci stiamo battendo, come ho detto prima, perché Erasmus si è triplicato, perché Europa Creativa si è raddoppiata, perché ci siano più risorse per la cittadinanza e più risorse per le nuove generazioni e certamente anche per, eh, per il, la continuità dell'attenzione del, dell al patrimonio culturale. Però dobbiamo essere consapevoli anche di un'altra cosa, lo dicevamo prima con, con Mircea, con Giulia, insomma con, il, con Luigi, quali sono le sfide anche di, di medio e lungo periodo e quali sono le priorità che dobbiamo dare per i prossimi anni, non solo per il breve periodo in cui ancora siamo qui, e, lasciare anche una, eh, e lanciare anche un'iniziativa nei nostri Paesi su questo. Per questo abbiamo chiesto non solo a delle eccellenti eh, esperti e rappresentanti che sono qua di essere con noi, ma ringrazio in particolare anche due rappresentanti del, 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 nel, nel, nel caso della Bulgaria, e cioè la eh, responsabile già ministro e responsabile della, 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 delle politiche economiche e, e scusate, educative della, 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 del, Partito, del Partito Socialista della Bulgaria, Anelia Kesarova, former Minister of Education, la ringrazio molto per essere qui, e per l'Italia nel panel della cultura, e lo ringrazio molto, c'è l'onorevole Rampi che affiancherà gli altri esperti perché è responsabile del Dipartimento Cultura e Partito Democratico Italiano e noi riteniamo che ci sia un'altra sfida quella di condividere come forza politica nazionale ed europea un orizzonte europeo per le nostre politiche nazionali. Io trovo che in questo c'è ancora un ritardo, un ritardo delle forze politiche nazionali. Non si capisce che non ci sarà nessun progetto europeo nuovo, rinnovato, se non si comincia a pensare in termini europei nelle politiche nazionali, sapendo che ormai l'agenda è quella, che l'orizzonte è quello e che senza quella dimensione non c'è nemmeno competitività possibile, non parliamo di sovranità, eh, ma parliamo di questioni che ci interessano come sviluppo sostenibile. Eh, vorrei solo ricordare che, eh, che è molto grazie anche al nostro impegno per l'allenamento europeo, se al summit sociale di Gothenburg si è inserita fortemente l'educazione e la cultura nell'agenda, voi sapete che nel, nel, nello documento originario non erano citate, come se il pilastro sociale non fosse possibile senza la precondizione che è l'educazione. Eh, siamo, siamo impegnati in questi anni di mantenere forte e alto l'approccio long life learning, di eh, dire che la modernizzazione dei sistemi educativi che condividiamo come linea della Commissione, ma include anche la inclusione sociale, 
che l'apprendimento permanente deve essere una sfida molto più forte per quanto riguarda in particolare gli adulti, ci sono ancora delle carenze molto forti in questo campo in Europa. Eh, abbiamo dedicato, grazie, penso senz'altro lo si deve riconoscere a noi, al Parlamento, eh, un anno intero al patrimonio culturale materiale e immateriale europeo ritenendo che identità europea e diversità culturale stanno insieme e non sono in conflitto eh, abbiamo ottenuto nei programmi pluriennali una maggiore trasversalità della cultura e del patrimonio culturale e delle imprese culturali e creative, qui vedo Luigi Morgano, in tutti gli ambiti come driver di innovazione, di nuova economia, eh, di nuova occupazione. E siamo finalmente alla partenza eh, di un programma che io ho molto chiesto come relatore Europa Creativa, cioè un vero programma europeo di mobilità degli artisti, dei professionisti, della cultura, della creatività. Sarà nel prossimo, nella prossima Europa Creativa. Eh, si approva oggi, final, si app abbia, approva la settimana prossima il regolamento sulla importazione dei beni culturali specie dai paesi in conflitto. L'abbiamo chiesto insieme alla all'UNESCO fin da quando c'è stata la tragica distruzione intenzionale di Palmira e di tanti altri straordinari patrimoni culturali, religiosi di altri paesi qui nel Mediterraneo e noi abbiamo chiesto primi in Europa e nel mondo, perché non l'avevano ancora chiesto nessuno, che fosse definito quello un crimine contro l'umanità. Eh, la intenzionale distruzione. Abbiamo rilanciato eh, il volontariato in Europa i, condividendo la strategia del nuovo corpo europeo di solidarietà su cui stiamo lavorando per costruire dal basso esperienze di cittadinanza europea e il primo pilot, progetto pilota è stato fatto a Norcia simbolicamente con ragazzi di tutti i paesi europei che hanno aiutato di fronte al terremoto. Eh, abbiamo lanciato una cosa a cui tengo molto, che vorrei che fosse rilanciata dalle università europee, quella dei corridoi educativi, come si dice corridoi umanitari per i rifugiati, sia per accoglierli sia per fare borse di studio. Si sono decuplicate le risorse per l'educazione negli aiuti umanitari europei, è stata una nostra iniziativa. Si è affermato che un aspetto centrale della modernizzazione e della qualità dei sistemi scolastici è l'inclusione sociale, è l'inclusione dei soggetti svantaggiati, è la capacità di includere fortemente gli immigrati in percorsi di successo. Abbiamo inserito con forza, qui vedo Giuli che è una grande combattente su questo piano, l'arte, la creatività e l'innovazione fra le competenze chiave e in particolare diciamo STEAM e non STEM, perché c'è anche la A di, di arte. Abbiamo detto che... Eh, la, il, che il patrimonio culturale è una grandissima eh, potenzialità anche di dialogo interculturale, di riconoscimento di una storia eh, comune, anche se difficile, ma di una storia che ha sulle, sulle ceneri eh, di, una, di una guerra fratricida ha costruito i valori che fanno forte e possono far forte l'identità europea, ma è anche fonte di nuova economia, di nuove priorità, di ricerca e di innovazione. Abbiamo detto che le competenze formali, non formali e informali devono essere riconosciute nei curricula e oggi sono obbligatoriamente riconosciute anche nell'Europass e questo con lo Youth Forum ho fatto una grande battaglia su questo e un'altra battaglia che abbiamo fatto insieme allo Youth Forum è stata quella della e-card europea per gli studenti. Noi riteniamo che questa possa essere una, non solo il riconoscimento dello status di studente in Europa anche quelli che non sono in Erasmus ma, ma soprattutto di possi possibilità di accedere a facilitazioni servizi, prestazioni e mettere la base di quello che in Italia si chiama il diritto allo studio, i servizi per il diritto allo studio, perché altrimenti ci sono solo le borse Erasmus che non bastano. E poi penso che questo significa anche quello che chiedono le università, che hanno fatto recentemente, eh, l'hanno chiamata proprio il, il summit, no, il summit eh, eh, mi ricordo il, il nome, una cosa del genere, il summit a Udine, il summit del 2017 delle università europee, e cioè di chiedere finalmente un vero spazio europeo anche per le università. Ecco, io credo che il punto però sia questo, noi possiamo fare questo tipo di azioni se però ci concentriamo su almeno tre aspetti. Il primo è capire come, eh, quali siano le sfide diciamo, più importanti con le quali ci confrontiamo sotto il profilo educativo e culturale, e non le, 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 molte le direte voi, io voglio soltanto darvi qualche spunto, e quindi come legare di più la sfida digitale ad un'assunzione critica dell'educazione in campo digitale che non è solo tecnologia ma è un ambiente, è una dimensione nuova della vita e della comunicazione. 
come questa sta sfidando anche le imprese culturali e creative nell'ambito della cultura e dell'audiovisivo, come sfida anche le, le nuove frontiere della ricerca, anche umanistica e nel patrimonio culturale. E ringrazio in questo Luigi che sta come relatore ombra di, di Horizon, sta puntando molto su questo aspetto qua, che oggi è molto disconosciuto nell'ambito di, di Horizon, come la, eh, le politiche, tutte le politiche di coesione, di, di ricerca, la Digital Europe, l'InvestEU, eccetera, devono essere attraversate da questa dimensione educativa e culturale. L'altro punto è quello che dobbiamo essere convinti a livello nazionale e europeo che senza un forte investimento anche di risorse, ma soprattutto in direzione della formazione e aggiornamento dei docenti, dell'innovazione e delle infrastrutture della cultura e dell'educazione. Perché non pensare, per esempio, di toglierle queste spese dal patti di stabilità? Le infrastrutture almeno, materiali e materiali dell'educazione dell e della cultura e il rafforzamento anche della, e quindi il rafforzamento dei programmi e della presenza dei programmi è una condizione per aumentare questa eh, possibilità. E la terza è che oggi, e chiudo su quello su cui abbiamo fatto il titolo perché adesso do, diamo poi la parola ai nostri relatori partendo da qui, noi abbiamo, detto, abbiamo parlato di una mh, aspirazione che adesso vediamo contenuta in un'indicazione di una comunicazione della Commissione europea, quella di costruire finalmente un'area europea dell'educazione. Eh, dell'educazione significa anche delle università, evidentemente. Oggi l'abbiamo per la ricerca, non l'abbiamo sufficientemente per questo. Ora, in una parola, cosa possiamo dire? Che la, la storia della politica educativa europea, che è nata nel 92, insomma, dopo, dopo Maastricht, e io, siccome sono vecchia, eh, ero, una piccola nota personale, ero sottosegretario dell'università del mio paese e ho partecipato alla prima riunione emozionantissima di tutti i ministri dell'educazione che mai avevano fatto il tavolo e c'era un allora straordinario e bravissimo commissario all'istruzione, all all'università e alla ricerca che si chiamava Ruberti e che ho avuto l'onore di conoscere, e che è stato l'avvio di questa politica. Questa politica è stata, di fatto in questi anni, di convergenza dei sistemi educativi. E, e poi la mobilità, e poi, assiste, e poi con i benchmark, gli standard di qualità, la valutazione comune, eccetera. Quindi ci si, son, ci si è dato una strategia comune, ma mettendo insieme, lasciando questa grande, diciamo, rispetto della sussidiarietà, che certamente deve essere. Ma siamo sicuri che non si debba fare di più e meglio per riuscire a rafforzare la dimensione di un'evera area che, che comporti mobilità, internazionalizzazione di curricula, più mobilità per docenti, ricercatori e studenti, ma anche e soprattutto di fare più joint degrees, di riconoscere, adesso si, le, la proveremo la settimana prossima in in, a Strasburgo, e la, eh, la nostra risposta alla comunicazione importante della Commissione, quella sul riconoscimento automatico dei titoli dei diplomi e dei periodi all'estero. Questa è una grande sfida, l'abbiamo apprezzata, perché è una forma di accelerazione di questo processo, troppo lento altrimenti. Per questo abbiamo chiesto a voi di discuterne con noi, perché questo è l'orizzonte verso il quale il nostro gruppo vuole andare, accelerare questo processo, fare di questa dimensione europea eh, dell'area della cultura, dell'educazione, della ricerca e anche dell'università una grande scommessa per, ri, come abbiamo scritto lì, eh, ridisegnare il progetto europeo. Questo è un po' il senso dell'introduzione, ho preso qualche minuto in più perché per fortuna sono sola, non c'è ancora arrivata la Rodriguez che parlerà dopo, ma io ci tenevo a dare il senso un po' di un lavoro e riconoscere anche i meriti di quelli che sono anche qua con, con noi, purtroppo oggi non può esserci, si scusa molto Petra Camerevert, la Presidente della Commissione di Cultura, perché ha un problema, un suo impegno a Berlino, e soprattutto dobbiamo scusare e, e farle tanti auguri la collega Libacca, eh, valorosissima, e nostra scelta rapporteur di Erasmus, perché ha un problema familiare per cui non può essere qui con noi, ma sperava di esserci. Ma insomma siamo ben rappresentati. Ringrazio naturalmente anche il Policy Advisors per essere qui con noi e i nostri collaboratori. Allora, io adesso devo cedere la parola, così alterniamo un po', al nostro moderatore. Voi pensate che sia moderato, non è moderato, è molto vivace e molto exciting, si chiama Marco, <ride> è già sperimentatissimo, abbiamo visto che sono già quanti anni, cinque anni che tu con noi fai questo tipo di ruolo, che sembra molto più vivace e che introdurrà eh, in un altro modo eh, questo nostro panel e poi daremo la parola ai nostri eh, invitati. Prego Marco, grazie. Good morning from my side and thank you Silvia for the, for the nice introduction in Italian. That's something new for me as well, to get the compliments in Italian. Indeed, that's a, 
uh, we have this tradition that I moderate one session per year when it comes to the culture, education, youth, and uh, now solidarity as well as a, as a new uh, new thing. So we've been working on the evaluation of uh, midterm evaluation of Erasmus Plus, then European Solidarity uh, Core when it come out uh, as well, new skills agenda as well, mainstreaming youth issues in the new uh, financial uh, um, uh, framework. So what we are going to do today, uh, I'm going to help a little bit, as uh, Celia said, with the moderation. Uh, maybe first of all, some uh, practical things. Are you connected to the internet? If you are not connected to the internet, you can uh, find uh, the papers yeah, over there or some, if you don't have, let's say, for example, 3G uh, internet. So that's the first uh, element I would like to introduce. Then the second thing uh, are the voting cards. We're going to make a little bit more uh, fun here this morning. It's a European Parliament, right? So let's give a vote, a uh, right to vote for everyone who is here. So you have those papers. So let's make it like, uh, like a traffic light. If you think something is uh, yes, that's a green one. You have a green one? Can I see? Where are the green ones? Yeah, in, in favor. Okay. Then we have, uh, we need one for, uh, for, for Celia as well. Uh, we have the green ones for the no. And you are wondering what is the, the, the yellow one? It's like so-so, you're not sure. So what we are going to do with these voting uh, cards, uh, after each, for example, panelist, we, we can check if you like it or you don't like it. Yeah? Yeah, I hope the panelists are ready, ready for the feedback. That's the first thing. Then the second thing, I'm going to pose some questions before the panel. So uh, we're going to check what is the temperature in the room according to that issue. The questions are a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, 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 tricky. So this is how I made it in a way. You will, you, shortly I will introduce that. So that's the, the second element. Then the third element is your mobile phones. You have your mobile phones? Yeah, can I see the mobile phones? <laughs> yeah, so we, before we move to the, to, the, to the panel, I want to introduce another element for this session. So take your phones, yeah? And we go, as you can see over there, so I want you to go to www.menti.com and use the code 359525. So go to the Safari in a iPhone or use on Android some other browsing program. Yeah. Everybody connected? We need the many competence, eh? digital competence. Yeah, digi as you can see, as Sylvia said, that the digital, digital era is coming, so we are already voting in the parliament, so... Yeah, there are one person is, has a pair of DMs maybe today, no? <laughs> so that's why he's in the session, no? Uh, yeah, somebody is in nice mood. We have one sleepy person as well. That's, but the good thing with this, with, this, uh, with this game is that we don't know who voted. So if you are sleepy, you're not afraid to put over there, I'm sleepy. Yeah, yeah? any other people? 26 only? Tips of uh, everyone. Uh, so that give us a nice uh, uh, input from different uh, stakeholders as well. And I think this is the last question for this warm-up thing. So what do you expect from the conference? I gave just a limited number of answers. So to hear some insights about new programs, to discuss about previous programs, to advocate for my organization, to network or something else. Mm -hmm. There are some other things, okay, a lot of other things, yeah. <laughs> so uh, when you speak later on in the panel, you can also explain uh, where you're coming from and maybe refer on this other because it might be also very interesting for other people, other delegates to hear. So we will come back to this, uh, to this tool to check what do you think about, uh, uh, about different uh, topics. So keep your phones around. That's the only conference that we ask people to keep, uh, to keep the phones. And we will go shortly to the panel. Just before I pass forward back to, to, to Sylvia, just the last thing. Uh, as you might know, and it was already mentioned, this will be a live stream. So when you speak, it is important also for the speakers to speak on the microphone on your, on your left because that is important for the live stream. That's number one. Uh, number two, those are the, those are, this is the, the Twitter uh, 
uh, that you can refer if you are tweeting from this room. It's important to reach people outside. And finally, those are the translation. Uh, the language is available. This is what we already explained. Those are two panels. Those are two panels. Ah, you, you, you made a mistake with the room. Yes. <laughs> they fun. changed the meeting. They, you they, should stay here. It's very make interesting. Make a mistake as, as for you the meeting. Good. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, OK, so, uh, so those are uh, two panels that we have. And you have it also in the program. And before we move to the, the last thing, before we move to the panel, I want you to use the red, green, and yellow papers. And the first question is, education is the best way to prepare young people for life. Whatever you understand. Huh? Green ones? Around. OK. I'll put so so. Huh? OK, good. So uh, you will have a chance in the end of the session also to change. Maybe you change your opinion based on some arguments of the speaker. So Silvia, I pass the floor to you to present the speakers. And, Thank you so much, Marco. Marco is a fantastic person. And also, I hope that uh, the same result of the green uh, will be at the end of the conference. <laughs> and so, thank you, thank you, Marco. And so, I give the floor now to the first panelist, and I thank her for to be here. And uh, she's uh, uh, Sasha Garben, permanent professor in EU Law Department of College of Europe, Bruges. But also, I know that I discovered that you are also been in uh, in a um, uh, European institution, university institution in Florence. And I'm very happy for this. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being here. And uh, I give you floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I would like to make three points about future EU action in education. And incidentally, they are a little bit like a traffic light. So first, I have a red light. This is orange, actually, but fine. It's a red light. I want the EU to stop doing something. And this is in the context of its economic governance in the European semester, where, as some of you may know, the EU issues so-called country-specific recommendations that are not legally binding, but that do take place in a coercive framework with the possibility of financial sanctions. Education has become included in the European semester, where it is being treated not as a value in and of itself, but instead as a factor of economic growth and competitiveness. Accordingly, the CSRs, by and large, scrutinize national education policies for their cost effectiveness and employability, i.e. how well they meet the needs and desires of businesses. And so, member states are encouraged to involve business in the development of curricula and to allocate public funding on the basis of competitive market mechanisms. All of this obviously represents a neoliberal view on what the role of education in society, which I disagree with personally, but more importantly, as a scholar, I disagree with the way in which these highly political decisions are being taken in the context of an intransparent and executive-dominated forum that excludes the European Parliament, as well as national parliaments, from any meaningful decision-making. So this is what I want the EU to stop doing. Secondly, I have what I would myself call an orange light, but let's call it a yellow light in this context. An area where I want the EU to continue, but with care, diligence and attention. And this is the area of mobility. Obviously, student and teacher mobility are the cornerstone of the European education area, higher education area. But first of all, I want the EU to become a little bit more protective of mobility in the European education area. What do I mean? I mean that the European higher education area, as many of you will know, is, of course, a non-EU, much broader 
project linked to the intergovernmental Bologna process, which includes a great number of countries beyond the EU member states, countries such as Kazakhstan, for instance. It's great to have such an international forum for collaboration on education, but I think in the EU context, we have some cause to be a bit more ambitious. We ha may have some specific needs and desires to step up integration in this education area beyond that bigger group and that intergovernmental context. So what do I want? I actually would like to see part of that Bologna process integrated or reintegrated into the EU internal framework, an EU education area, firmly grounded in EU institutional and legal structures. And yes, I do think we have the legal competence for that under Article 165 TFEU, as well as the internal market provisions, the provision on diploma recognition, etc. At the same time, I also want the EU to be careful not to encourage what I would call disembedded mobility. What do I mean? We have 28, 27, well actually more than that, education systems in the EU, which is great. It's a resource to be treasured. But if you, in a blind way, apply mobility rights and policies in such a diverse context, you may create imbalances, asymmetries, it might have a disruptive effect. This, a minute and a half, a minute and a half. <laughs> I, um, I would say, in if you create these asymmetries and imbalances, as we have seen in the context of Austria and Belgium, for instance, which had their medical schools over flooded by German and uh, French students who were escaping their numerous clauses at home, okay. eh? yes, then which led to a whole range of political, legal, uh, normative problems. You see that we have to be careful. What do I want? I want the EU to invest in knowledge here. What do I mean? Carry out studies as to the comparability and the differences between the education systems, not from the perspective of Europe 2020, but from the perspective of the EU education area. And what policies do we need and what, what do we have to be careful of to make this EU education area work? Thirdly, my green light is for the EU to develop more ambitiously citizenship education in schools, in curricula. Contrary to common perception, Article 165 TFEU provides the competence for the EU to do this. A very interesting article recently published in the European Law Review by Chris Grimprez explains this in detail very convincingly. And I'm just going to say there were three proposals she made that I think deserve consideration in this respect. First of all, the extension of the Jean Monnet program to schools. Secondly, the creation of a database on EU citizenship education. Um, and thirdly, the inclusion of citizenship competence, EU citizenship competences, in the various competence frameworks and diploma supplements and, and whatnot at EU level. Right, so there I, I conclude, but actually I am going to sneak in a final remark because if I really could have what I wanted, I would replace this whole traffic light that I just described by a roundabout. What do I mean? I would want a revision of the treaty. I would want a proper legislative competence for the EU in this area. Why? Actually, education, as we all well know, can already be harmonized, can already be integrated in various ways. However, it has to happen surreptitiously because the EU does not have direct competence on many issues in this field. So it happens through an intergovernmental Bologna process parallel to the EU. It happens on the basis of the internal market, right, through the back door. It happens on the basis of the semester, through the bathroom window, I would say. 
I just want the EU to be able to go through the front door on this. It's more legitimate and more effective. I know it's wishful thinking, but I guess that's what we're here for today. Thank you. Some feedback. Yeah? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good sign, but <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, I appreciate so much this intervention. I'm very glad to, that you be here. <laughs> I heard and read something about your proposal in your uh, uh, articles, uh, books, and so on, and uh, I totally agree that we have to be ambitious, that we have to use more what is already inside tra the treaty, uh, subsidiarity is not a, a, an obstacle to, to do so, and to, um, to increase uh, citizens, uh, citizenship education inside any programs, also at the national level. This is, is one of the, some of the examples, but is you, your, your speech has been more deeper than my words, and uh, I imagine that some of the uh, public can can uh, recall some proposals. And then I give the, the floor to Tamara Gojkovic, yes. uh, Vice Director of Lifelong Learning Platform. And so it's, uh, maybe that you can, uh, can give us some uh, results of this platform, of this uh, important uh, educational approach that we inaugurated so many years ago in, in Europe and also for mm -hmm. reconnecting with this proposal. Thank you Indeed. so much. Uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, the uh, things that I will mention are very much aligned to some things that have already been uh, mentioned. But I will go back to that uh, roundabout that uh, Sasha was mentioning, and it, that's exactly what we in Lifelong Learning Platform want to have, a roundabout of uh, learning. We want to have a holistic approach uh, to learning, and we want EU to focus on a citizen, on a learner, and uh, acknowledge that uh, it's, it is about a lifelong learning, that we are learning from the day that we are born, uh, until the day that uh, we are here <laughs> around together. Um, <clears throat> and um, Lifelong Learning Platform is gathering actually the uh, institutions and organizations that come from different uh, aspects of uh, education area. We gather also organizations from higher education area to non-formal, informal learning, uh, youth organizations, uh, vocational training, and so on. So uh, there is a huge, um, uh, huge spectrum of organizations that are actually uh, working together to promote a lifelong learning concept. And that's something that we uh, stand for. We believe very strongly and we welcome uh, every uh, proposal that is related to access to quality education and to um, voicing the citizens' concerns, and that's something that uh, we want to do. We believe that uh, what's very important is to have the policy coherence. And although we are welcoming very much uh, the proposals also from the Commission side, uh, we believe that uh, we need to have, uh, we need to break down those silences and that we need to think out of the boxes. We should not be put into boxes. And there is this uh, impression that we actually are. Because each yeah. uh, educational uh, institution is always going towards the program where it kind of uh, believes or it is, is uh, taught to believe that naturally belongs. So higher education always um, works with higher education and it has changed a bit with Erasmus Plus and we are very grateful for that. Yeah. But we believe that we can do more. Uh, that uh, if we want to talk about education, we at the same time we need to talk about the culture and we very much uh, welcome the initiative of uh, STEM versus STEAM. Yeah. We, we believe that STEAM is something something to, uh, to support because uh, arts, culture, and non-formal education, informal learning, that is all that is uh, supporting us as individuals, as active citizens, and um, uh, overall as uh, learners. And that's something that is developing our soft skills, something that is not only there to uh, boost our employability, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, what is also important, and you have already mentioned, is the social inclusion moment. Social inclusion in the sense that we are not starting from the same point. We, are not, we don't have the same uh, starting points, and uh, we are different. We have different needs, and we, that needs to be acknowledged. So uh, if we, are, we're, we should not be talking about the excellency. We should be 
giving opportunities to everybody. And that's something that there, there's a whole um, um, spectrum, again, of, uh, of organizations and institutions that are working on uh, with people uh, who have a bit more, let's say, sensitive backgrounds yeah. and do have uh, fewer opportunities. And that also bring us, brings us uh, to the fact that we also believe, uh, as I already mentioned, cradle to the grave, uh, so to say, we need to involve all uh, age groups. And that is very important. We are working a lot, and uh, EU is working a lot uh, on um, uh, early child education. We are also working a lot on uh, adult learning. But we also need to acknowledge that it's not only about that. Not only students, for example, or young people should be mobile. We need to uh, give opportunities also to cultural workers, professionals, uh, to teachers, to educators, as we like to call them, as well, uh, to be mobile. And if it's going to be about virtual uh, mobility, that is also something that Commission is at the moment. Uh, developing the virtual exchanges and so on, which is, there is a window of opportunity to um, support people to, ex uh, to experience EU in at its best, I would say. Um, and additionally, um, and I will be uh, quite uh, brief uh, from now, um, we need to involve everybody. Um, everybody means uh, no, uh, citizens. We need to listen to citizens uh, first of all. We need to involve different institutions. Uh, we should not be only, again, uh, put in silos or put in those boxes and uh, talk only with higher education about higher education because I believe that we can contribute a lot by exchanging uh, views. Um, I thought I would not get the alarm, <laughs> but still. Um, indeed, uh, we need to talk together about things, and this is what lifelong learning is about. Uh, as lifelong learning platform, we are also proposing that uh, instead of a student card, which is excellent initiative and should exist, we also have something that is about lifelong learning uh, card. That means that it's not only about yeah. those who are studying, but those who are willing to learn and who are learning throughout their lives in different ways. We are proposing also community lifelong learning centers, where we can uh, learn together. Is it, it's not only that it's going to be young people, there will be families uh, learning together because maybe young people will also um, motivate their parents uh, to learn together uh, and to develop because that's uh, what is it all about. Indeed, and I think that uh, one last point, we need to create synergies. There are a lot of a lot of, lot of things going on, a lot of things supported by uh, EU, and I think that everybody is very grateful that so many ideas can be implemented. But what we believe is that also we need to create synergies ab among all those initiatives, and we need to um, put them under, under one umbrella, I would say. So these are just some of the points maybe to uh, talk about uh, also later on in the panel, and um, something that we would like to see. So it is about the learner, it's about the citizen. That's what we stand for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. There is just the one yellow. This is what good. <laughs> Thank you good. so much. <laughs> totally, uh, um, I totally agree with this uh, overcome the silos approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's important. Maybe we have to consider in a critical way, I speak also to my colleagues, that sometimes we debate about it, that also inside the parliament, Sometimes we created a little uh, silos because uh, uh, it's not the question of a cult committee competence or ample committee competence, but sometimes we lose hmm, the holistic approach to this uh, uh, education uh, in a transversal way, because education is uh, upper education, uh, basic education, etc., uh, but also a partnership now, no? and the, the, the same dignity uh, from a uh, scholar education, a student a, a university, and uh, uh, VAT and so on, and we have this um, this uh, um, uh, this is competence uh, split in two committees, and sometimes this is not in favor of this uh, new approach that we totally share. That can be a, a, a reflection that uh, also the new parliament has to consider for me. And so now I leave the, give the floor to Andrea Casamenti, European Youth Forum. It's not only uh, the prevalence of Italians because uh, it's a youth forum that, uh, that they appoint him. Eh? So it's not up to me to decide. Prego, Andrea. Yes, good morning, everybody, and, and, and thank you very much, MEP Costa. I'm going to speak in English, although I'm Italian, so, so um, in, indeed some diversity. Um, so 
Um, just a few words about the European Youth Forum, first and foremost. Um, the European Youth Forum is the platform of, of youth organizations in Europe. We represent over 50 million um, young people all over Europe. We represent their common uh, interests and the ones of their uh, um, organizations, and we fight for their rights. Um, and one thing that I always like saying uh, in these contexts, um, we're also the biggest youth-led movement in the whole world. So um, I think it's kind of impressive. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, we're talking today about reshaping, uh, reshaping Europe. Um, so what kind of Europe do young people in Europe, uh, um, what kind of Europe do young people want? And uh, we've been asking this question uh, a lot in, in the European Youth Forum. And I have to say that one of the points that really came out from our discussions is that um, young people want a Europe that speaks to our values and aspirations of um, human rights, of, of uh, solidarity, of equality. And talking about human rights, um, we do want a Europe, we dream of a Europe where our human rights as young people are, um, are fulfilled. Um, for instance, the human right, the right to, uh, to quality education. We're talking about education today, but also the, the right to uh, engage in volunteering activities, and I'll go into volunteering a little bit later. Um, and then when we talk about education, we cannot avoid uh, talking about, in my opinion, youth organizations, because youth organizations are education providers. Sometimes um, this is a bit forgotten, and, and uh, there, we tend to talk a lot about uh, um, a formal education in Europe, but youth organizations are education providers. They provide uh, very valuable um, educational opportunities uh, for young people. I don't think I have to go uh, deep into uh, into explaining this, but uh, um, so uh, it, youth organizations are indeed very important in this context. But sometimes there's but we see that there's still a lack of recognition of of um, the role of, of youth organizations um, as education providers which limits also our access to policy making and, and policy co-creation in the field of, of education. And also despite this, uh, um, the 2012 Council of the EU recommendation on validation of competencies, we still see that there's a um, little work done at member states level on, um, validate, on the validation of the competencies acquired, for instance, in youth organizations through non-formal education methods. Um, and when we talk about youth organizations, we talk also, of course, about quality um, citizenship education because youth organizations um, do uh, provide a lot of activities and programs uh, um, that are related to this topic, to the topic of, of uh, citizenship education in which young people um, uh, develop skills that enable them to take decisions, to make choices, to and to assume responsibility for their own right, lives uh, within a democratic society. So we call um, on the EU and on the member states uh, um, to, to act on a few points. I'm going to go through them uh, quite quickly today, um, we call on them to um, to uh, continue efforts to implement uh, a national recognition and validation system uh, for the competencies acquired in, in non-formal education activities, uh, to ensure the presence of young people in decision-making related to, to education, to ensure support for youth work, and to recognize, of course, youth organizations as key quality uh, um, providers of education. Um, we also call on, on, on the EU to foster on an uh, ongoing and Europe-wide discussion on a common understanding of, of citizenship education, for instance. Um, and of course, we cannot avoid talking about uh, um, Erasmus Plus as the most uh, uh, successful EU program. Uh, we call on the member states, on the, on the European Parliament and the European Commission to be at least 10 times more uh, um, ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with uh, <laughs> ten times, ten times more ambitious with the budget and the outreach of, of uh, the program, and also um, um, still talking about education to encourage partnerships between the formal and the non-formal uh, education providers. And I wanted to give you two examples uh, from two of our member organizations, uh, Tripoli YFU, for instance, developed um, a manual called Color Glasses, um, which is a manual that is uh, that basically contains ready-to-use workshops on, on intercultural learning for use in secondary schools. Uh, Obeso developed a manual um, to increase participation of, of young people in, uh, in schools, so to develop their capacity in management of uh, an organizational structure and, and so on. Just a few words also on, on, on volunteering. Um, in the European Youth Forum, we, we uh, absolutely believe in the value of volunteering. Youth organizations are funded, are uh, uh, built on top of the uh, daily work of, uh, of volunteers, and it is one of our core um, 
uh, activities to provide quality volunteering opportunities uh, to, um, to young people. But we believe that there are still a lot of obstacles in Europe to, um, to volunteering, so for young people to volunteer, and not just when we talk about uh, transnational volunteering. So we see a need to ensure um, better conditions for, for volunteers, and we, we believe that we can do that by ensuring that the rights uh, of volunteers are recognized and protected through, through suitable legal frameworks, uh, by recognizing, that volunteer, recognizing the importance and the role of volunteering, um, by guaranteeing access to quality volunteering opportunities, by providing secure and sustainable funding for volunteering organizations, and we also call on the EU to um, uh, create a wide EU strategy um, really aiming at enabling and, and, uh, empower, um, and enabling and creating an, empowerment, uh, an empowering environment sorry, for, for volunteering in Europe. And just a few words um, on this, when we talk about volunteering, of course, uh, we cannot mention the European Solidarity Corps. Um, uh, and uh, on this program, we uh, do welcome this program and we welcome also the proposal of the European Commission for the next um, uh, period. So starting from uh, 2021, um, just one thing on this, we do believe that this program needs to build on the already existing work of youth organizations, of, of volunteering organizations, uh, and needs to learn from EVS, needs to learn from uh, the challenges and, uh, uh, and the great work that is already, that is already been uh, 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 done by many organizations. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the aim of the program should really be to support uh, these, um, these organizations in their work. Thank Thank you very much. Five minutes. Yeah. God, it's terrible. You managed. <laughs> so much. Bene. It's a good result. Eh? <laughs> uh, we take in a very uh, high consideration of your proposal as a youth forum on uh, Solidarity Corp uh, proposal for the next uh, 21st, 27th uh, multi annual program. And uh, you know. Also, our position as group, as a shadow rapporteur of my group, that we are, uh, we want that to continue this uh, uh, solidarity corp based mainly on volunteer, uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, also training or, 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 or education to, 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 to the citizenship and so on, and uh, only a quota for some activities, work activities. We have not to confuse. The, the legal basis of this uh, very important corp, also because uh, I imagine that this also created these informal uh, and not formal competences, and also based on the experience of organization, of uh, youth organization, so on. And so we will insist on this. Uh, thank you for your suggestions. Now I will uh, give the floor to Luciano Sazo. Luciano Sazo is a vice rector for European University Networks. Uh, uh, that is, the name is Unica, he will explain what it is, uh, and he comes from uh, La Sapienza, Università di Roma. Good morning to everyone, uh, thank you very much to Silvia Costa for the very kind invitation, it's a great honor for me to be here in this uh, very important room uh, dedicated to Aldo Moro, who was a professor of my university and as you know was kidnapped and killed in 78, uh, I remember that day. And uh, I hope the very strict moderator will not be too strict. I will probably uh, take a couple of minutes more uh, for my talk. I will go very quickly on some slides because, of course, I know that most of you are very expert in what I will mention. So the next one, please. Come from Sapienza is a very large university with more than 100,000 students, and I always say it's a good gym for us to actually uh, exercise and to learn about higher education. The next one. Uh, and I'm also president of this association, which is based here in Belgium, in Brussels. It's called UNICA, means uh, universities from the capitals. So we represent 49 universities from 37 capital cities in Europe, uh, you know, with the, in geographical sense. So we, we have several countries not belonging to the European Union, such as Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, Turkey, Russia, etc. The next one. Uh, so I would just want to remind you know to all of us of course we are very experts you know about the successes of higher education in Europe first of all 1997 we know Erasmus the next one uh, 
was uh, was really a very good name, first of all. I believe I'm a pharmacologist, actually, by training, and I believe in names. Names are very important. And sometimes also, for, I mean, I would say uh, the, some of the names of the programs of European Union change, and we know that there's really a lot of work to inform everyone, the families, the students, the scholars about, you know, this new program. So I really would recommend to keep as much as possible the consistency of names in yeah. European. Erasmus is really, was a very good name because we know that was a scholar who taught in different universities in a period in which a lingua franca was available. We had Latin at that time, so it was actually easier to teach in different universities at the time of Erasmus than not today. And actually it was also an acronym. We, we forgot that it was an acronym for European Region Action Scheme for Mobility University Students. And we have to remember some of the, let's say, uh, it was a, just a small group of visionaires who designed that, I'm very proud as Italian to remember Domenico Leonarduzzi and Sofia Corradi, uh, who, by the way, Sofia had problems in recognition of her, her, her previous studies. As a that's, why, <laughs> that's why she said, okay, let's start to integrate you know, uh, European uh, uh, degrees and higher education. So it is not by chance that actually the Bologna process started in 1999, about, you know, 12 years after the Erasmus, because the Erasmus created the problem. Yeah. The next one, the problem of, you know, mobility, and so students were going to other universities finding other systems. Even myself, I went to the U.S. actually before the, uh, the Bologna process, and you know, with my little, little rusty English, I was saying, okay, I have a degree. As Italian, that was enough. I didn't know exactly what a bachelor was, what a master's was, what a PhD was. So, I mean, I still myself, I don't consider myself so old, but I have to say that indeed, I felt that problem of recognition, that problem of differences in, in Europe of, of system. And of course, Erasmus is very successful. We went to very few thousands of students moving in the beginning to about nowadays 300,000 students per year, which is very good, but still, to be honest, we have to consider that Erasmus is actually still an elite program. So if you take students from low social economic background, the mobility of these students is very low. So we have to consider this problem and really increase the budget to allow everyone willing to do that to do Erasmus. At the moment, this doesn't happen. The next one. And uh, I already said that, next. We continue very quickly. So, of course, you know very well, you know, the successes of the Bologna process, you know, the harmonization of the structure. But still, if you go to the ground, if you talk to the families, the students, the, the professors, there are people complaining about the Bologna process. So, again, we have to dissemination, communication is very important to make sure that everyone, not just experts like us, will know about the successes of the Bologna process. Next one. Yes. Which, in the way, like Sasha said, was the only way, you know, to implement things. So the Bologna process was really great, but again, the communication is, is not, uh, you know, the diploma supplement. If you talk to industry, they don't know what the diploma supplement is. So it was a great tool, but I think the effort to disseminate, to make sure that everyone outside academia knows what these tools are, I think is very challenging. The next one. I will just, I will, I will go quickly. I know that I have only five minutes. I will go next. You know everything already. So just I want to mention also this issue of the migrations because this also has an effect on universities. And I will mention what, what are we doing as universities about that. Of course, as Italian, I feel very much ashamed of what is happening because the next one, please. Uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the numbers of uh, Italians migrating to Belgium, the peak was more than 250,000 people per year. And this is actually much more than what is happening now of migrants going through the Mediterranean to Italy. The next one. But if you take Argentina, that's impressive. In the 20s, you know, the peak was more than 900,000 Italians only going to Argentina. So we have to remember these numbers because when we say uh, Europe is flooded, is invaded by <laughs> migrants, this is not, no, not really true. Last year was only 40,000 people. In 2015, the peak was about 1 million people, but to Germany and 180,000 people to Sweden. This was really the highest peak, but still lower than these numbers. The next one. And uh, I want to just to point out this, this important paper in Nature. Nature is the most important, uh, as you know, uh, journal in science. And this is, you know, about the numbers. You see uh, the generosity of some countries, you know, in 2015. But uh, even more important, the next one. Sorry if I go too quickly. Uh, I, I also, you know very well this one. Next, 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 please. <laughs> This is important. Okay, uh, these people, as you know, they reach us, they reach Europe 
through a journey that very often takes more than two years. Mm -hmm. And of course they have, they, we call them stressors, stressors before they leave, because you leave home when home does not allow you to stay. So there are problems when you leave home, and many, in many cases it's violence, wars, dictatorship, etc. So these people already are, are stressed in a way before they go. Then they are, through this journey of two years, you know, everything can happen. Violence. Most of the women are raped, even men. There was an interview to a man yeah. in the Aquarius that when they reached uh, Valencia after about 10 days when they were not allowed to reach Italy, one man also was raped. It happened. I mean, this is co co completely uh, incredible that we Europeans, we believe in certain values, but then we uh, allow these people to reach us in these very bad conditions. And there is a big problem of mental health. I'm just coming from Berlin from a, a meeting uh, called the World Health Summit, and one of the sessions was about mental health. I mean, most of the people in this paper, I really recommend you to have a look at this paper in Nature, it's, a, it's an excellent journal. Uh, in 2016, okay, 50% of the people reaching us, they saw corpses, they saw dead people. I mean, can you imagine, many, in many cases, these are relatives of them, children parents, whatever. So this is, I think, morally is not allowed. I mean, it's not possible, especially for us, because we are actually Europeans, we're migrants. We've been emigrating everywhere. The next one. So to be concrete, I mean, there are some actions that universities are taking, like, you know, train, also Sylvia already mentioned that, training of experts, education opportunities, research opportunities, even some fast tracks to have, if you have a person, let's say, coming with a medical education, that person can actually help other people, you know, if you recognize the skills. So we are working on the recognition of these skills, even if some formal papers are missing. There are sometimes problems of formal papers missing, but there are ways to actually recognize skills through special exam, etc. And the next one can be useful because the EUA, which is the most important association of universities in Europe, is more than 800 universities created this platform called the Refugee Welcome Map. So there you can find the initiatives in all countries for migrants. So I think that we should really try to link these initiatives with other political initiatives. The next one. And then just I want to mention one uh, current uh, initiative that the Commission just launched. We are waiting uh, uh, you know, with some anxious uh, spirits <laughs> about this call coming up uh, because, as you know, uh, there is a pilot to create so-called European University Network. Yeah. So uh, between five and eight universities are encouraged to work together yeah. in uh, education, research, and innovation. So in a way, we have been doing this for a long time, but this is the first time yeah. in which we have to work together also in research and innovation. This will be a little bit more challenging. So we are creating consortia of universities. This is very interesting. It is challenging, but my university is, is very committed. We already created a strong network about that, and we're waiting for the call to apply. <laughs> the next one. And also, I want to conclude very briefly. I, I know that the moderator is looking at me. <laughs> but um, and by the way, can I have a no, joke about moderators? <laughs> I know that in academic, uh, academic uh, uh, meetings we have moderators. When you have a children party, you have, we say in Italian, animateur, the animator. So it should be the opposite because children are already very active and should be moderated and academics should be activated. So I think <laughs> the terminology should be, should be changed, but anyway. Uh, and so the um, one point is related to the digital era. This is, of course, is completely changing everything. You know very well the industry 4.0 revolution, artificial intelligence, etc. So companies say, I'm from the pharmacological part, so I know quite a lot also the pharmaceutical company. They actually don't know in 10, 15, 20 years what will happen. So it is very important for us universities actually to train our students in, uh, you know, in learning. I mean, we have to teach them how to learn rather than provide information. Information is available on the internet. Anyone can find information, but the problem is the framework. You need to have a very cult good cult cultural framework. And so more and more interdisciplinary training will be very important. You cannot just have a scientist ignoring art, yeah. culture, history, etc. We need to have this integrated culture to face 
this revolution, and already it's amazing. I mean, there are robots that are doing incredible yeah. things already. So artificial <laughs> intelligence is coming very quickly, and in 10, 20, 30 years, you know, we will have a really very clever artificial machines. The next one, and also final point, and I really promise I finish. Uh, I think also our responsibility as university is to really create more job creators. There are so many opportunities, especially in Europe, rather than just job seekers. You know, it's not like before the people were looking for a job. We should make them available to create new jobs in Europe. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. You. Thank you so much. Uh, many compliments. Also, it's up yeah. to you. Well, <laughs>и различията, и обаче и приликите, защото всеки език е красив и аз обичам нашия език, то е наистина много красив. Първо, искам да благодаря за поканата да бъда тук, много на, да благодаря на Момчил Ненков, мой колега, който изключително активно участва в работата и на българския парламент. Благодаря ти, разбира се на организаторите, Специално благодаря. И да започна по-бързо, защото сега пък ще кажа, че много дълго съм говорила и няма да ми даде повече думата. А, сега, аз за разлика от досега говорещите искам да представя нашата визия, българската позиция, как, как трябва да върви образованието и да обърна едно по-сериозно внимание на средното образование. За това, защото за да има висше образование, университети и наука, началната подготовка, мотивацията на децата да бъдат в училище и да се учат и да се развиват, за нас е изключително важна. Това сме поставили и в центъра на нашата визия за България. Ако обичате слайдовете, ако искате не ги слагайте, в нашата визия за България, че образованието, науката и културата са основен приоритет и те трябва да вървят заедно. Не можем да делим едното от другото. Целта на нашата визия е, че всеки човек трябва да може да бъде съавтор, т.е. цялото общество да бъде приобщено към проблемите на образованието и науката и културата. Защо казвам това? В нашата страна след проведена една анкета... Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. lights, uh, we need the Okay, because my slides is in English, but it's no problem. We okay, we'll stay so. And now, later. And what? Uh, do you know, in our country, 61% of our country, 61% of Bulgarian citizens say that they are not happy with education. You will say that it's horrible. But on the other hand, it's positive, because there is a motivation for приобщаване на повече хора, на образователната система да мине на по-високо ниво. За съжаление и 23 000 деца годишно остават извън образователната мрежа. Въпреки, че по Конституция в България образованието до 16 годишна възраст е задължително, една огромна част, близо една пета, една шеста от децата или не остават в системата, отпадат по-рано от системата, или въобще не искат да влязат в системата. Това е изключително голям проблем. За това казвам, че за нашата цел, на нашата визия е да направим така, че образованието да не се подчинява 
на простите, както каза Саша, много добре го каза, а не на простите економически. Дай той да учи, че да стане работник и веднага да започнем да печелим. Не, това не може да бъде цел на образователната система. Ние трябва да създадем такава система и даваме такива предложения, които да развиват младите хора, да им дават шанс в живота, да могат те да се реализират реално и на пазаре на труда и в живота. За това казваме, че и Тамара подчерта това, и Силвия подчерта това. Мотивация за учене, умение за учене. И тук идва мотивацията и умението за учене през целия живот, както каза Тамара. Това трябва да стои в основата на всяка една образователна система. Разбира се, трудолюбие, организираност, умение за критично мислене, анализ на информацията, всички тези неща, аз ги бях показала на слайдовите, после може би ще се видят. Сега, какво стои в нашата визия на основно място? За да се случи всичко това, ние слагаме на основно място учителят. Да, има ги дигиталните системи, но без тези модератори няма как това да стане. Нали? Трябва някой да ръководи проблема. За това е издигане статуса на българския учител на по-високо ниво. Пълна държавна издръжка в детските градини. Това е това пълна издръжка на децата в детските градини. В България има социално слаби деца, които не могат да отидат на градина и на училище по социални и финансови проблеми. Това не бива да бъде допускано. И това е така наречената и детска гаранция, която е предложена в Европейската комисия. Здравословно хранене, здравословен начин на живот и достъп до безплатно образование. И основна тема, която искам също да посоча, това е, че учителите трябва да пътуват. Имаме такъв проект. За началните форми в образователната система е много трудно децата да стават рано, да пътуват с автобуси и да стигат до средишното училище. Не, нашия проект е пътува учителят. Дори и пет деца да има, там трябва да има учител. Така ще имаме по-голям обхват и няма да водим до закриване на училища, което е една много грешна практика. Освен това, модел за нас ще бъде и да повишим дигитализацията в образованието. Нашето образование трябва да отговаря на съвременния свят. Без дигитални възможности, без необходимата инфраструктура, това няма да се случи. Трябва да обучим и учители, и ученици, младите хора искат това и то разбира се е, трябва да бъде на линия. И когато говоря за всички тези неща, за личностна подкрепа, дигитално образование, стигаме до парите, което беше казано така. В момента в България 3,4% от брутния вътрешен продукт се дава за образование и наука. В Европа между 5 и 6%. Нашата цел е до 2020 година да стигнем пред процента от брутния вътрешен продукт за образование. Какво предлагаме? Или на кое искаме да бъдете и вие, и ние са автори? Предлагаме така. Преференциални възможности за по-бедните изоставащи страни, за догонващо развитие в областта на материално-техническата база. Това е ключово да възпитаме младите хора към условията на европейските ценности или младото поколение да бъде свързано и с европейската култура, и с европейското образование, и европейските ценности. Второ, създаване на достъпно и открито онлайн пространство за дигитална среда и мониторинг в образованието. Нека бъдат разработвани дигитални учебни програми. Да се учат и учителите, да се учат и учениците и както има такава мрежа създадена за университетите, то нека да има такава мрежа за създавана и за учителите, а и за всички хора, които искат да участват в нея. Предлагаме образование 4.0 да включи създаването на дигитални библиотеки. Ако има такива дигитални библиотеки, то тогава ще е достъп до тях ще имат и от малките населени места, и от по-бедните страни, и учени, shorter, и студенти, please? и ученици. Финиш. Окей. За това. И разбира се, знаете ли, един голям проблем е Европейски регистр за проследяването на движението на децата. В момента ние не знаем колко деца от България са заминали в Брюксел или в Германия и от тях посещават училище. Това е изключително важно, за да можем да признаваме образователни етапи и да не задържаме децата в тяхното развитие. И 
Както казах, ти автоматично признаване на дипломите във висшето образование. Мислили сме заедно по този въпрос. Искам да завърша с едно. Нека работим заедно с тази стратегия и нека всеки от нас се чувства съавтор в тази стратегия за единство и солидарност. Благодаря ви. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Silvia? Thank you so much. Uh, I totally uh, agree that we have to uh, pretend eh, that uh, any member state devote more money, more, um, more, more, more resources to, to, to for investing in, 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 uh, in education, also for the infrastructures. Mm -hmm. Maybe that we can share a proposal on this, but I know that also in the cohesion policy there is, can be many resources for infrastructures uh, to, to increase also the access this is very the, the first the first our objective of uh, uh, of uh, students of, of young people in early early age to to the to the right to study that's uh, very very important that you mentioned this and now our uh, moderator okay so uh, back uh, the floor is back to me uh, so I'm looking now first for the timing. We have started 20 minutes uh, with 20 minutes of delay. So it was previewed to, to, to run the first panel until uh, 10.45. Uh, uh, but we, of course, we're gonna take a little bit more we're going to take a little bit more time uh, for this. Uh, we, how, how it's going to work, we still have, uh, I guess if I understood well, uh, Silvia, we're going to have still presentation of one idea from our guests. We're going to get then the reactions, first initial reactions from the Commission, then we get to some opinion of the, of the MEPs, and then we can have open floor for the questions and uh, any kind of opinion from your side. So I think we can run this panel until 11, that give us still Time for the, for the second panel for, uh, let's say, one hour and 15 uh, minutes. So I think it works uh, uh, good like this. So maybe shortly uh, you can present yourself, give a, a very uh, brief uh, presentation of idea, and then we can go on as I presented. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you to Silvia Costa for inviting us. It's a very big honor for us to be here. I'm Matteo Mirabella and I'm here with Giacomo Calabrese. We are the founders of DOTI, DOT Erasmus is the first community we've built of exchange students based on solidarity and uh, sharing. I would like to switch to Italian if it's okay for everybody in order to express what my heart has to say in the better way. Um, Um, DOT eh, è la prima community di eh, Erasmus e Student Exchange basata sulla solidarietà e sulla condivisione. Grazie. <laughs> Scusate, l'abbiamo costruita con Giacomo quando eravamo nei nostri periodi di scambio, Io ero in Brasile, Giacomo era a Siviglia e l'abbiamo costruita perché sì, è un'applicazione mobile e l'applicazione sarà lanciata la prossima settimana e l'abbiamo costruita appunto perché rispondeva a quelle necessità che noi abbiamo incontrato durante il periodo di scambio e che abbiamo scoperto tantissimi ragazzi come noi condividevano, ovvero ehm, il ragazzo che va in Erasmus è un viaggiatore e un viaggiatore durante il periodo del viaggio eh, si diventa persone sagge, si diventa persone sagge perché si incontrano gli altri e si scopre eh, davvero, ci si riesce ad aprire al mondo e, e si compie un viaggio anche psicologico di, di crescita. Eh, nel periodo pre-Erasmus, quando si deve decidere, eh, magari non si sa dove andare, non si sa se si scopriranno amici, si è pieni di dubbi, si cerca online, su pagine Google, le informazioni sono eh, datate, eh, incerte, ci sono blog. Eh, nel periodo dello scambio si vuole scoprire, non si hanno connessioni al di fuori della propria città Erasmus e nel post-Erasmus eh, tutto, che è un'esperienza meravigliosa, finisce in un attimo e si ritorna alla vita reale con quella sensazione di depressione post Erasmus, che penso sia una patologia studiata ormai. Ehm, per questo noi abbiamo costruito e sviluppato questa app che andrà online la prossima settimana. Ehm, abbiamo un prototipo, in realtà. Ehm, non so se Giacomo riesce a collegare il PC. Ehm. In questa applicazione ogni ragazzo che partecipa a scambi universitari si può registrare e cercare una città eh, europea. 
troverà tutti gli studenti che partecipano a programmi di scambio in quella città o che hanno partecipato e potrà eh, applicare dei filtri. I filtri principali che noi abbiamo studiato sono tre. Eh, talking, quindi trovare tutte quelle persone che sono disponibili a dare informazioni dirette in chat. Ho bisogno di questa informazione, non di mille. Ho bisogno di una persona che sia stata in questa città e che lo sappia. Prima la cultura veniva trasmessa eh, dal nonno al padre al figlio sul territorio, perché era quello il territorio che si viveva. Adesso si vive un territorio senza confini. Quando io andavo in Spagna, mio padre non sapeva che cosa dirmi. Avevo bisogno di una trasmissione della cultura che sia senza frontiere, con dei confini fluidi, come sono oggi. Gli altri due filtri eh, sono quelli che a noi eh, piacciono in particolar modo, e sono meeting and hospitality. Questi ragazzi viaggiano, come abbiamo detto, e viaggiare significa incontrare le persone, non visitare, eh, calpestare altri suoli. Eh, incontrare le persone, quindi trovare tutte quelle persone che sono disposte ad incontrarci, a condividere momenti con noi, ad introdurci nei loro ecosistemi, per poter vivere le città con gli occhi degli studenti Erasmus. Eh, questo è appunto il nostro progetto, vi ringrazio per la possibilità. L'hospitality eh, è appunto il core, eh, è la vera solidarietà del progetto. Eh, questi ragazzi viaggiano e eh, essendo studenti effettivamente i fondi sono un po' sempre quelli che mancano per viaggiare. Questi ragazzi si pensi che secondo un nostro sondaggio compiono più di 7 viaggi durante l'anno dello scambio, alcuni arrivano a picchi di 25 viaggi. Conosciamo ragazzi che scoprono davvero la cultura del paese attraverso gli spostamenti e trovare persone che sono disponibili ad ospitarci a casa propria. Noi abbiamo lanciato un progetto pilota e siamo, ospitati, siamo stati ospitati questa notte a casa di alcuni dotter, come noi li chiamiamo, eh, qui a Bruxelles vicino al Parlamento Europeo e ci hanno veramente aperto le porte di casa loro, ci hanno raccontato come vivono a Bruxelles, ci hanno lasciato le chiavi di casa, quindi massima fiducia per tornare da loro nel momento in cui vogliamo. E sono tristi che restiamo solo una notte. Eh. <ride> Grazie. grazie, grazie a tutti. Grazie. E... Grazie ai due nostri inventori di questa app. Io penso che sia, adesso non, non è, se, se alla fine di tutto c'è il tempo, lo faremo vedere. Si lancia la settimana prossima, quindi volevamo darla in anteprima qui a Bruxelles. È un'app che consente queste eh, tre dimensioni dell'incontro, del sostegno e dell'ospitalità. Lui l'ha detta breve, ma l'ospitalità è fatta in rete, in, in ospitalità presso le famiglie, presso, in modo come dire, accessibile. E questo perché risponde a un, a un interesse enorme nostro forte anche del nostro gruppo, anche in questione cultura, che è l'accessibilità dei programmi europei. È un grande, una grande questione di uguaglianza, una grande questione sociale, una grande questione di opportunità. Grazie, grazie davvero. Marco, vai con Thank you, nostri... Silvia, and thank you as well for this uh, uh, nice idea on how to uh, also encourage a lot of uh, new exchanges between the especially young people. So what uh, we are going to uh, look now, maybe for some uh, feedback from the Commission, there have been already mentioned many things. Uh, yeah, we can also go like that, yes. Uh, yes, okay, so uh, we can go with uh, uh, Mr. Neko, maybe with some reactions to what has been, there is a lot of ideas around. So what are your uh, initial thoughts on the, on the, so please take the floor. Thank you, Marco. I would like to take the floor to outline the, the main priorities for uh, our ICT group. Uh, I took my notes in Bulgarian, so I'll proceed uh, in Bulgarian, but uh, uh, before that I would like to congratulate our uh, speakers here, because they are from different areas and uh, they really uh, supported us and delivered uh, some important information about our SND group, how can we proceed further. Uh, but I think that everything is uh, embodied at national and regional level, and that's why I would like to say a couple of words about that one. Um, 2025, 49% of the workers who are qualified, 40% of the level of the and 11% qualification. 70 милиона европейци нямат никакви компетентности, нито по четене, нито по писане, нито по смятане. И точно тук смятам, че а, когато говорих с Силвия да направим подобна конференция, целта беше следната. Каква позиция вземаме социалистите, с какви идеи ние се явяваме на изборите, за да може да ги спечелим, за да може ясно да, да посочим 
къде и кого поставяме на първо място. Ние избираме да поставим хората на първо място, а не дигитализацията. Точно поради тази причина и като докладчик на New Skills Agenda for Europe и като докладчик на Дигитална Европа от страна на социалистите, искам винаги да има повече пари и за учителите, и за самите умения, т.е. да се придобиват умения от от учащите и то през целия живот. Това, което каза и мистър Сасо, не знам дали го произнасям правилно, той приключи точно с едни данни, които са много важни за нас. Ние трябва да създаваме хора, в които да инвестираме умения, а после на тази база те вече да придобиват теорията. И много важно нещо, да могат да различават фактите от просто изразени мнения. А затова, когато говорим за социалистически идеи и послания, тук Силвия и ти го каза, много важно е програмите са функция на политиките. Наша политика е още от най-ранна детска възраст да защитим подрастващите. Затова аз съм твърд привърженик на Child Guarantee, на детската гаранция, защото това е най-уязвимата група. Тя е много по-уязвима, отколкото и от възрастните, а оттам започва всичко останало. Затова това, което искаме да направим в България, да приобщим всички, да ги вкараме в образователната система, за да може след това ни да им дадем едни базови знания по четене, писане и математика да могат вече те да се развиват, да върнем блясъка на професионалното образование и обучение. Нещо, което в България през миналия век сме имали много добра основа и е давал много добър резултат, е много европейски държави са вземали тази практика от България за професионално образование и обучение. Един мой също приоритет, който работя през последните 4 години, е неформално образование и обучение да настроим системата. И искам да завърша точно с това, което ви казах в началото, за регионалното и националното, с финансова подкрепа на СНД, на нашата група, утре в моят роден град в Селистра в България, който е малък и се намира на Дунав, може би това е една от най-источните точки на Европейския съюз. Ние ще представим едно проучване, как може да направим да да дадем фокус между бизнеса и образованието, за да може реално да видим от какви хора се нуждае бизнеса, за да може тези хора да не напускат родното ми място, Селистра, и да не напускат България, а да могат да се реализират там и същевременно да създават бизнес с партньори и от Европейския съюз, и извън Европейския съюз. Благодаря за вниманието. Пожелавам успех на конференцията. Аз след малко трябва лично да тръгвам, защото, както ви казах, утре ще го представим в Селистра. Това означава, че имам да сменя два полета и след това да потъвам 500 км с кола. Така че ще ме извините. И смятам, че по този начин, с прости идеи, когато ги показвам пред хората и с малко повече емоция, нещата могат да се получат за изборите. Благодаря ви за вниманието. Thank you very much, and also safe safe trip as well. Good luck with your things, yeah. Grazie, Mountain. You know that maybe that others doesn't know it is important that you recall the our proposal for child guarantee is an ongoing proposal by our group, and so thank you for having recalled this. Grazie, and thank you for being here. Okay, uh, so now we can go to the Commission. I know it's not easy for you now to respond because uh, obviously there are many stakeholders. There are some many stakeholders in the room with, uh, uh, of course, different interests. And uh, we could see also that audience supports the most of the ideas. But then, of course, it comes to the certain limitation when you start uh, drafting uh, the thing. So when it comes to the, uh, there are several things mentioning about Erasmus Plus, Euro European Solidarity Corp as well, and then as well some other things. I will not get into details. I guess somebody from the public will mention them. If not, I have prepared already the, the question. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, so what uh, we have here, a little, a little change. So instead of uh, um, uh, Giorgio, uh, that is not here in the session. We have Sarah Lynch, for, that is also head of sector for Erasmus Plus. 
uh, coordination and as well as well uh, Flor Van Hood that is head of unit for youth volunteering solidarity internship office Europe, also in European Commission so maybe some initial thoughts and answering to some questions that are uh, posed from the panel as well yeah uh, good morning everybody I, I can start um, I think we're probably all on the same wavelength, really, because if you see the developments that have taken place in uh, education and culture at European level over the last, I would say, year and a half, two years, it's very much going in the same direction. The first of, of bringing education and culture together and, and seeing how they can be rein, how they can reinforce each other in, um, in reaching uh, a, a warmer embrace of the European identity, I would say, among, especially among young people. Um, and the second is about the, the social inclusion aspect, which I think is, uh, has come through on a, on a couple of different occasions. Um, but this is something that has come up in, in great uh, importance in, in our work in, in recent times. Um, I would draw your attention to a couple of our policy documents that have come out recently, which were the, the Commission communications at the end of 2017, another one in, in May of this year, um, we also had a recommendation on promoting common values, inclusive education and the European dimension of teaching, which I think is uh, very relevant to a lot of the issues that have been discussed here this morning. <clears throat> um, in terms of relaying those to national, regional, local players, um, we, we do rely a lot on our interactions with um, with partners, with stakeholders, and also with the member state authorities. And we, we bring those together in what's known as the ET2020 context. Um, that's a, a, a support um, and mutual learning framework um, which has helped to showcase a lot of very good practices in, in a lot of the issues that you've raised this morning. I know in the citizenship working group that they, they do a lot of work, certainly on the migration issue that uh, Mr. Sasso mentioned, um, that there's a lot of mutual learning of, of good ideas that, are, that work in practice that can be replicated elsewhere, and this is how we hope to um, use those as a, a multiplier. Um, I think I want to come back... <clears throat> primarily on, on the one line that uh, you mentioned, Mrs. Costa, which was the, the importance of having the programmes and the policy linked together. And that's something that we take very seriously. Um, we have come out with our proposal for the new Erasmus programme in May. Um, we're working on that with, with yourselves. We're slightly more advanced, I think, time-wise in, in the Council, but uh, we're looking forward to the, the draft Parliament um, cult report that will be coming out next Monday. Um, that we, we want to advance in all of these areas through the funding and the support that we can deliver through the Erasmus programme. Um, the Erasmus programme itself is fairly lean in terms of architecture, in terms of the detail that it provides there, but the general themes are certainly represented in terms of the inclusion and how much we want to use the doubling or tripling or you know, 10 times uh, increase of the budget to reach out to, uh, to vulnerable groups, to people with fewer opportunities, to newcomers to the programme, to those who may not have been able to access it in previous uh, programme uh, periods. Uh, we also don't want to forget the, um, the innovation and excellence that is also supported through, through the programme um, in terms of the... It's, it's no... It, I don't think it's a shame to say that, yes, CSRs uh, maybe focus excessively on education as a um, focus of the workforce, but education, of course, is necessary to build uh, the skills that are needed for people to, to access and uh, thrive in, in the labour market. Um, there's also, I mean, many other elements to, to the programme that I could mention, but those were the main ones that I had uh, come up today, and I hope that the work can progress quickly to the adoption of the, of the programme for the, so that we can guarantee the implementation of it for the new period. I'll hand over to Flor now, uh, who's more on the youth and uh, on some of the comments that were raised on volunteering and on the Solidarity Corps, maybe. Thank you, Sarah. And... Um, Indeed, if I, if I look at my notes on what I picked up from, uh, from the speakers, um, it shows that colleagues in DG Education and Culture working on education and youth uh, share already a lot of the same thinking. So when you mentioned uh, the need to uh, cut to silos, I think here in DG Education and Culture we're doing our best. And indeed, 
Um, what I wanted to add on, um, on this topic, values, inclusion, citizenship are actually also very much the priority areas we work on in youth policy. So they increasingly converge and the Erasmus Plus program has greatly helped to reinforce this kind of cooperation, um, working across different sectors, having partnerships between different organizations, as some of the, uh, the speakers had, uh, had said, is a very good and important thing where everybody can learn and discover new ways of working and probably uh, deformalize education a little bit and perhaps uh, create some uh, formalized approach to validation of non-formal learning. So these kind of approaches can really genuinely bring new ideas and uh, to the benefit of everyone. Uh, so what is happening in, in the, the youth field, indeed, um, we're very proud that now since I'm counting the days, um, 11 or 12 days, the Solidarity Corps is really there. Um, the first call for proposals has, uh, has closed earlier this week, and uh, our national agencies are very keen to start evaluating this project so that uh, by the end of the year, the uh, core members can really uh, go and uh, work on volunteering and uh, and solidarity under the new legal base. We're also um, currently um, discussing with the Council the new EU youth strategy. The Commission has proposed that earlier this year. And um, this, this um, uh, strategy is, is generally axed on two, um, on two uh, pillars. On the one hand, uh, citizenship, participation of young people in, uh, in civic life. But on the other hand, uh, while doing that, also learning and developing one's skills. Um, because what, what, uh, what Andrea said from the Youth Forum, I, I could have made my sheet greener if I could, um, is indeed is whilst engaging in, in uh, organizations, whilst putting your energy and efforts to society, you actually gain a lot back yourself. I think this is also maybe an experience that you try to, um, to promote as well in, uh, with your app. Um, and so we feel this is important, and the new youth strategy um, is very explicit about that. Compared to the previous one that had eight fields of actions, we really want to bring out the added value of youth policy itself in its own right um, to three um, what we call keywords, engage, connect, and empower. Engaging is about uh, listening and talking to young people uh, when it comes to policy making, uh, having a dialogue, knowing what is uh, important. We can learn a lot from uh, the experience of young people. And for them, it's also a way of making democracy come to life. Connecting is equally important. Uh, the core already came up, but uh, it's much more than just uh, the solidarity core. There are many different ways in which we can connect young, young people. And the great thing about all these programs is the, the outcome and the impact is amazing. Um, it's always the best part of our job to ask young people who've been on an Erasmus, who've been on a Solidarity Corps activity, and now the Discover EU travelers, what they, uh, what they learned. And it always comes straight from the heart, this uh, experience of meeting other Europeans, of discovering other traditions, and there's, life is larger and there are more opportunities outside of your own country. And this is always the common thread to all these mobility programs. Um, finally, empower, because we want all young people to, be, uh, to have access to this, to, to be able to benefit from these kind of opportunities. And for some, it goes without saying, it happens, but others need the support of youth workers or organized structures to be able to know that this is an opportunity. Uh, sometimes they don't understand why it's so important for them. And sometimes, uh, and especially for young people that drop out and are very demoralized, it is an amazing uh, way to uh, regain confidence and discover that you can invest in your skills even after a failure in school, for instance. We have a lot of tools. I think in the current thinking, the, the numbers, we're almost reaching the end of the alphabet about how we can bring this to life. Um, but we are ambitious. We want tools in the new strategy that, uh, that really make us uh, go from talk to action and uh, we're very committed to uh, play our part and we count on the member states and the uh, youth organizations young people parliament and everybody else to uh, to be with us on that journey so i'll end here i'm very aware of the clock thank you thank you very much should we give also the voting for the commission like in a, in a package no <laughs>
I know everybody wants to keep a good relation with the commission, but let's be honest, no? Okay. There are some yellow papers. It means we're going to have also nice, uh, nice discussion. But before, I think we also need to give a little bit more time here for this panel. So before uh, you, uh, yes. You want? You can. Yeah. Okay. Allora, allora, innanzitutto grazie, sarò brevissimo e dico solo alcuni titoli. Mi pare, innanzitutto ringrazio i relatori perché mi pare che abbiano davvero, come dire, eh, sostenuto eh, tutta una serie di scelte che come gruppo S&D abbiamo realizzato all'interno della Commissione finora e la strategia generale. Mi pare che le questioni di fondo riguardino, da un lato, eh, una scelta più convinta di campo, complessivamente dell'Unione Europea nel suo complesso, ma evidentemente anche del gruppo S&D per quanto riguarda eh, attribuire un di più di priorità a queste questioni con grande rispetto rispetto ad altre. C'è secondo me uno spazio di valutazione ulteriore dei programmi che si può fare e il raccordo è un po' come dire la richiesta che ripetutamente abbiamo avanzato. C'è una disponibilità della Commissione, ma insomma poi qualche volta c'è qualche che è difficoltà ad operare, nel senso che ci sono canne d'organo all'interno e qualche problema ci può essere, ma sono anche convinto che ci siano oggi spazi ancora importanti a trattati vigenti che possiamo utilizzare, il che non vuol dire che non sono d'accordo, sono perfettamente d'accordo che bisognerebbe fare ben altri passi in avanti. E allora che cosa posso aggiungere? Il primo dato. Sul tema che è stato ripetutamente ricordato, il compito dell'istruzione è quello di una formazione completa, mi permetto di dire che nel eh, discorso che abbiamo appena approvato, cioè la risoluzione, la, il parere nostro su Horizon 2021-2027, abbiamo particolarmente insistito su questa questione e quindi al di là di quello che è il percorso curricolare classico, che vengono introdotte tutta una serie di, diciamo pure, di insegnamenti complessivi, non sto parlando solo dell'università, ma dei, dei vari ordini e gradi di scuola, una formazione umanistica adeguata, perché questo è uno, ed è importante che sotto questo punto di vista ci sia un'integrazione reale di educazione alla cittadinanza. Una seconda questione che mi permetto di sottolineare, c'è una risoluzione che abbiamo votato, manca la collega Libacca che ha ricordato prima Silvia Costa, che ringrazio per questa iniziativa, sulla modernizzazione dell'istruzione in Europa, di cui, su cui siamo stati particolarmente impegnati tutti e mi pare che anche lì si possa attingere, se si vuole fare qualche passo in avanti, qualcosa eh, anche di tipo strettamente operativo. Il, pilastro, il, il discorso di Gothenburg che ha riguardato il pilastro sociale, ma che ha visto un inserimento adeguato di, finalmente, della dimensione culturale nel senso completo, a me pare comunque un passo importante, perché la sottoscrizione di un'intesa tra i, le tre istituzioni dell'Unione dell Europea rispetto ad un impegno su questo aspetto, su questa questione, dice di un cammino che è stato quello propedeutico, ad esempio, in passato per Lisbona, per i trattati di Lisbona. Quindi sono tutte questioni che, insomma, se non si fanno i passi, eh, credo che poi eh, non si possano compiere. Certamente non intendiamo che il 2018, l'anno europeo della cultura, sia un anno così, ma dovrebbe essere il punto di partenza. Sul Fondo Sociale Europeo mi permetto di insistere un po' di più, perché oh, stamattina ovviamente non è che si poteva fare tutto, ma insomma eh, un, una serie, ci sono una serie di approfondimenti che possiamo fare e dietro questo discorso ovviamente c'è il tema delle risorse e all'interno del tema delle risorse, visto il quadro economico, c'è anche il tema delle risorse proprie dell'Unione Europea per far fronte alle grandi sfide. Eh, non è questa la sede, ma io credo, insomma, occupandomi anche della Commissione Economica e Monetaria, qualche aspetto qui bisogna... E di, e non è un caso che Silvia... Eh, prima abbia fatto riferimento al patto di stabilità e vedere se qualche voce concordemente tra gli Stati possiamo non considerarla perché è un elemento anche questo di una riflessione importante che certamente non risolviamo solo in Parlamento ma qui è il rapporto con il Consiglio e quindi in particolare con eh, i singoli Stati. 
dire che vogliamo arrivare ad un'area europea dell'educazione mi pare che sia la strategia vera dell'agenda che abbiamo messo in campo mi permetto di aggiungere che forse un di più di attenzione dovremmo riservarla a tutto il settore della formazione professionale lo dico per tanti motivi ma eh, cito solo un dato ad esempio nelle industrie culturali e creative che è il settore che assorbe più eh, presenze di parte, da parte di giovani l'occupazione di cui parliamo qua Quasi il 20% è costituita da giovani che hanno superato solo l'obbligo scolastico, 15, quindi all'età 15 anni, e va fino invece all'alta formazione, compreso il dottorato di ricerca, 29. Perché dico questo? Perché vuol dire che c'è uno spazio su cui ragionare, che in qualche misura tiene conto di quella che è la dinamica occupazionale futura, di quello che stiamo vivendo, ed è un aspetto che deve diventare un po' più strategico, perché è ciò che contraddistingue ovviamente l'Europa. Ultimo e chiudo sul tema del volontariato che mi pare molto importante, però una riflessione maggiore rispetto a che cosa significa oggi volontariato, cioè il rapporto volontariato e gratuità, credo che sia un elemento culturale che dovremmo riprendere. Io devo dire che sul corpo di solidarietà sono d'accordo per una serie di aspetti ma l'aver lasciato questa ambiguità nel testo non giova se si vuole favorire l'occupazione ci sono strumenti, spostiamo le risorse nel, nei, diciamo, negli ambiti più propri ed evitiamo che possano nascere difficoltà inutili perché mischiare le cose non mi pare che sia in questo momento eh, la cosa migliore. So che questo è anche l'esito di una difficoltà all'interno del Parlamento e del rapporto tra commissioni, quindi non, non attribuisco a nessuno la responsabilità, ma credo che mettere a tema questa questione, lo dico in particolare al forum dei giovani, è una cosa rilevantissima. Grazie. Grazie, thank you so much. Thank you so much Luigi, also for the last uh, okay. consideration I totally share with you. Um, now mm -hmm. we change... Oh. Ah, sorry. Yes. Oh, one sentence. Uh, uh, because I imagine that you will speak uh, yeah, for yeah, the, the second else. panel because we are very late, Julie. One sentence. Okay. One sentence. In, in, meanwhile we can yeah. change? No. I okay. just... <laughs> no, troppo. Um, my colleague said many things that I, that I agree with and Um, but I just want to um, uh, make people aware that um, if, we, if we're going to tackle the, all the, the, the huge challenges in the future in terms of um, the digital agenda, automation, robotization, enforced leisure, early retirement, lifelong learning, um, whole, lots of issues about how we spend our time, i would be very interested in the Commission responding to my continuous requests for a European occupational literacy strategy. Now, I have spoken in the past week to uh, the Commissioner from Entrepreneurship about this, and I keep mentioning it because it is, it is a, an area which could apply to every single person. There is not a single um, demograph demographic group or Um, age group or anything for whom this would not be relevant. And we need to come up with strategies that are inclusive of the whole of society. People are doing quite well financially, people are not doing very well, refugees who are coming, people are retiring, people who are in work, people who are out of work, young people who are not even, you know, who are still thinking about it. But if we all know how to spend our time better and we feel more in control of that, then actually lots of different policies would fit together. So I'm being very, very boring in the last five months six months of my mandate, but I keep repeating this because I know if you say the same thing over and over again, like I did with STEAM, in the end, it goes into the Commission language. So occupational literacy needs to be my other legacy. <laughs> Brava, Julie. <laughs> thank you, Julie. And so, thank you for the panelists. Thank you for your contribution. And now we change the panel. Uh, I invite uh, the... Silvia, we have still questions with the... So maybe uh, you can stay, stay a little bit more because we have yeah, some questions from the... You can also use the, these ones if you really need to speak. You can use the orange one or the green one if you don't need to speak so much. Yes, so we got the first question over there. Yeah, let's pick up the three questions. We are very late. So three people who are the fastest now, you can go on. Yes. <coughs> So, Angel Gudigna from Don Bosco, parlerò in italiano per rispetto al nostro fondatore e perché parlerò di formazione professionale, che mi è mancata con delusione nel panel, meno male che i due eurodeputati che sono intervenuti l'hanno citata. Perché lo dico? 
perché nel primo intervento ho mostrato il giallo, perché le aziende devono essere coinvolte, coinvolte ma la responsabilità educativa rimane in noi, gli enti educativi, certo. ma loro sono soggetti principali da coinvolgere per quello che ha appena detto l'onorevole Morgano nel riguardo dell'industria culturale. Nel senso che se non siamo aggiornati non riusciamo a inserire lavorativamente. Ma la scuola, la scuola tecnica deve essere quella che mette la cittadinanza. E ovviamente quelli italiani conoscono il motto di Don Bosco di resti cittadini. Certo. Per questo lo dico, perché se la eh, Strategy 2020 vuole arrivare al 40% di educazione superiore, che facciamo con l'altro 60% a livello di cittadinanza europea? Per questo, questi sforzi sulla mobilità per i ragazzi di FP deve essere ugualmente possibile che per uno universitario, e so che l'S&D è su questo pilastro, ma serviva a dirlo oggi, sì. anche eh, la speaker di Bulgaria che ha parlato de, 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 dei NIT e dei ragazzi che escono, fare una identificazione di questi, inviarli subito a un'educazione più adatta, più skills, mm -hmm. ma... Con fare un'educazione tecnica non esclude un'educazione in valori, un'educazione umana, Beh, certo. ma questo serve dirlo, ah, e so serve bene. dirlo quelli che forniamo, e soprattutto mettere al giovane, al learner, scusate se escludo l'Education for Adults, è mm. al centro del nostro processo, ma tutti coinvolti, ma la responsabilità deve essere degli enti educativi. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very important uh, mm -hmm. Other two people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raffaella Kira from the European Association for the Education of Adults. Mm -hmm. um, I very much agree with uh, Professor Sasso, uh, Sasso who um, said um, that uh, the name of Erasmus is very important. I uh, believe as well that Erasmus, the name, carries uh, a message. That's why uh, we believe that the plus should stay in the, the future uh, program in Erasmus Plus um, because um, if we, we uh, think about the, the, the program it's not only about higher education and mobility but it's also about other sectors, it's about lifelong learning and if we want to have an inclusive character of the, the, the new program then it means also um, including adults for example, we, we didn't mention them so much, particularly non-formal uh, adult education. Um, so. Um, if we want to, to reach out to vulnerable uh, groups um, from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, but also from non-disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly if we think about citizenship, then we need to, to, to include that. This is about uh, strengthening also democracy, about uh, strengthening community learning, and uh, other aspects that we need for a, a good program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, may I uh, respond to, to conclude? Can we pick up the, another question and then, yeah, please? Okay, thank you. So my name is Clara Rettini. I'm representing actually Italy at the Young Leader Azam Summit, but I'm very happy that I'm here because I care a lot about education, working on the London School of Economics as an academic officer for the SAFTA project. Um, I wanted to also address to Professor Sasa, really glad that you mentioned this quote that the Erasmus actually is for the elite. And it's true. And I think, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's I mean, inequality is increasing in Europe a lot. It's just not about affording Erasmus, but it's also a lot of people cannot afford a first degree, a master degree. And also, if you want to achieve a leadership position, you also need to be able to attend, uh, let's say, like, uh, you know, like the College of Europe. I saw the colleague, it's smiling at me. And for example, I'm Italian, and uh, I can bring your example. I. I was selected for the College of Europe. My Minister of Foreign Affairs didn't give any scholarship for this year. And in order to attend an elite school, I need to go to a bank and get a loan of 25,000 euros. You think a bank can give us that amount of money in three weeks? No. So, and now it's a very uh, funny situation because now I'm in the UK and the, with the Brexit situation, at least now in London, I can afford like um, really like leadership in a really elite uh, university. But I think like maybe instead of addressing um, our money and our funds from the European Union in this course are very important as volunteering, et cetera, I think we should use that money to create more projects as Erasmus Mundus and in order that more people can achieve leadership position and we also address and stop populism which is spreading out. Because we see as the elite, we they don't care about what we're saying right now. So I think if, 
make possible that everyone is able to go to LSE, to the College of Europe. It's not impossible. We're not about talking about something no sense. I think that we will solve also other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so before, before I pass the floor to, to Sylvia to also to close the panel number one, I have prepared, I knew that this question will come up into the session, so I ask you to take your phones, because the next question is, should the Erasmus Plus program keep the plus in its name? You see, I'm prepared for the session, you know? <laughs> yeah? Let's see. Okay, uh, we got three questions before. Before I pass the floor, I guess, similar to you to close, and maybe, is there something maybe from the commission to react on those uh, remarks on before, or it was covered? Sorry, we have something no time to react? now, because... Okay, Sylvia, I pass for, for you to close, then. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. In Italiano. Allora, prima di tutto, io all'inizio ho citato naturalmente la pari dignità e l'importanza dei sistemi istruzione e formazione professionale, sapete che ci si crede moltissimo, l'abbiamo detto in tutti i documenti, è bene ripeterlo e la ringrazio di averlo sottolineato. Credo che ci sia non una questione di seconda chance soltanto, professionale, ma proprio di un approccio integrato dei sistemi. Per questo dicevo prima che i silos a volte li ripetiamo qua dentro ed è un rischio. E secondo, perché io sono personalmente anche stata molto impegnata nella mia regione a far nascere gli istituti tecnici superiori, cioè quel pezzo che manca un po' nel nostro Paese, ci sono anche altri che invece hanno molto avanzato questo, come la Germania, la Francia, l'Inghilterra, e cioè quella formazione non accademica, in collaborazione con l'Accademia, post diploma, mh? tecnico, sì, dual system, de tecnica specialistica, eccetera, di due anni. Questo credo che sia la grande scommessa se si vuole unire la, e anche dichiarare la parinità dei percorsi, quindi sono d'accordissimo. E anche per recuperare una situazione difficile anche di, di benchmark che noi non raggiungiamo. Secondo, per la questione del più plus, io personalmente sono a favore, eh, spero che lo sia anche il um, collega Libacica che è il correttore Ombra. Guardate, noi diamo per scontato che le persone abbiano capito tutte che Erasmus eh, non è solo un, un programma per gli universitari e per la mobilità. Sono già cinque anni eh, ormai che è così, ovvero, però vi assicuro che si fa molta confusione e quando si va a parlare non agli addetti ai lavori, tutti dicono peccato che non c'è più, non c'è abbastanza per la scuola, non è previsto per la formazione professionale, non è previsto per i ricercatori, non è previsto per i giovani, che invece abbiamo difeso moltissimo lo youth program e anche la questione di Erasmus Mundus a volte un po'. Quindi io non voglio ritornare ai nomi antichi, anche se secondo me potevano benissimo convivere sotto l'ombrello di Erasmus, però attenzione perché anche levarlo levare il plus può sembrare che effettivamente eh, non ci sia spazio per gli altri programmi cioè l'articolazione delle iniziative sotto Erasmus è molto più vasta e noi siccome adesso metteremo e sono d'accordo con la commissione anche la mobilità per i ragazzi delle scuole superiori e rafforzeremo i, le partnership che è la Key Action 2 e eh, tutto questo deve essere chiaro non è soltanto per le università personalmente insomma ritengo che si sia fatto una fuga in avanti e che non si rend, ci si renda conto che c'è una difficoltà poi a, a, a capire d'accordo molto con le cose che le ha detto, noi abbiamo tentato, io ricordo l'esperienza dei loans, no? dei de premi, dei de prestiti d'onore, eh, non ha molto funzionato, stiamo verificando se, se, se ci potrebbe essere un ripensamento, so che c'è stata una proposta nuova, va verificata anche con i giovani perché non ha funzionato, però certamente il tema del costo delle borse, della possibilità di accedere preventivamente, a, lo conosco bene questo tema e io per questo dicevo che noi dobbiamo anche trovare le modalità di eh, aumento significativo dei fondi e spero anche della consistenza delle borse, oltre che servizi e prestazioni che uno dovrebbe poter avere anche attraverso altre formule per facilitare l'accesso. Mi scuso ma mi fermo qui perché altrimenti non diamo lo spazio come giusto che sia al secondo panel che vorrei invitare a salire, do la parola subito a Marco che lui sarà pra come rendere più effervescente questo passaggio. Penso che ci possiamo chiudere su tre parole eh, che sono eh, educare all'Europa, 
educare in Europa con sistemi che siano comparabili e eh, avere un'area educativa europea. Ecco, su questi tre punti possiamo concludere. Voglio ringraziare il collega Giorgio Grammaticakis che ci ha raggiunto e il collega Daniele Viotti della Commissione Budget e vicinissimo alle nostre tematiche. Grazie. Prego. Ok, thank you. Thank you Silvia for... Uh... Concluding, uh, while the new panelists are coming to the stage, I would like to ask a bit uh, so we can warm up for the next, uh, next panel. Yeah, so for this one, I would ask you to take your voting cards again. It's a lot of voting today, so. Yeah. So we start with, uh, again, the tricky question like before because the panel uh, it will have to do with the culture, creativity, and media resources for development, inclusion, and innovation. So I ask you to, again, to use your uh, red, uh, yellow, or green cards. And the statement is, the culture is the best tool to promote European citizenship. If you think the answer is yes, the green one. If you think the answer is no, then the, the red one. Or the yellow, if you're not sure, like so-so. OK. So we got, let's say, the majority of the people or the delegates in the room say it's the, the green one. Still keeping green one on the, on the, in the air, <laughs> Mr. Ward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we got some yellow ones. So I guess those people have either a different opinion or maybe uh, would like to hear more our panelists. So I, I pass the floor to Sylvia to introduce the panel and also our panelists. And... Uh, just to warn the panelists, I will give you the sign as before, so it means you have one minute to finish. And this time I really need to keep it uh, strict because it's a second panel and usually people are more sleepy in the second panel, so we need to be really brief. Yeah. Celia, please. Uh, uh, I, I will introduce in a very, very briefly way. Uh, gra uh, Italiano, grazie per essere qui. Uh, in particolare ringrazio i nostri panelist, adesso poi ve li presenteremo, ringrazio la Commissione, eh, che è Barbara Gessler e altri colleghi della, e altre persone della Commissione che sono qua con noi, ringrazio molto Georgios Gramatikakis che è il relatore della, in Commissione Cultura della nuova importante Agenda Europea per la Cultura, che ha tra l'altro questo approccio olistico e che riprende molte per i prossimi anni e che riprende molte delle eh, proposte che il Parlamento in, ha fatto, che noi abbiamo anche ottenuto come risultati di questi anni di lavoro sulla cultura e soprattutto che dà una, una prospettiva che va oltre l'anno europeo ma per dare continuità a quello che è successo l'anno europeo. Eh, Giulia l'avete già sentita, Giulia Wardolt è anche relatore ombra dell'importante nuovo programma per la, chiamiamola, eh, per la cooperazione eh, allo sviluppo dove c'è dentro finalmente la strategia anche sulla diplomazia culturale, chiamiamola così molto, molto breve, che è stata una strategia che abbiamo in inaugurato l'anno scorso e di cui sono stata correlatore con il collega Brock in Commissione Esteri e soprattutto ringrazio eh, Daniele Viotti perché eh, è qui, eh, perché ha sempre avuto una grandissima attenzione a questi temi, educazione, cultura, solidarietà e tra l'altro è eh, anche coerente perché nella Commissione Budget lui si, ba si è battuto e si batterà <ride> per i nostri obiettivi che sono anche nella cultura di aumentare le risorse e di dare più centralità e più integrazione della dimensione culturale con gli altri programmi europei. Siamo in un momento strategico, come dicevamo prima, alla, e stiamo lavorando tutti sui i programmi pluriennali. Ehm, io penso che noi possiamo dire che sul fronte della eh, cultura noi abbiamo eh, 3-4 punti che voglio solo mettere alla vostra attenzione, così do subito la parola, non perdiamo tempo. Ehm, nel programma, eh, nelle 10 priori priorità di Juncker all'inizio di questa legislatura, la parola cultura semplicemente non c'era. Io credo che il grande lavoro che è stato fatto, e penso che la Commissione possa, la DG, insomma, possa darci ne atto, è stata quella di non demordere e di rilanciare fortemente nella nostra Commissione, ma poi abbiamo avuto solidarietà anche in altre Commissioni, ehm, questa, eh, questa dimensione culturale del progetto europeo partendo da alcune cose. La prima è stata una, uh, riprendere quella bella, in, quella bella comunicazione che c'era stata precedentemente sulla, uh, per una gestione integrata e partecipativa del patrimonio culturale, materiale, immateriale e ormai diciamo digitale. 
senza una ripartenza da questa ricchezza, da questa risorsa, eh, eh, che è sia per quanto riguarda eh, un senso di appartenenza, di identità europea, sia per valorizzare le diversità culturali, che è una grande ricchezza, e sia perché questa è la metafora di una storia e di un dialogo interculturale senza il quale non c'è futuro per l'Europa, e anche perché è un engine, come si dice, un motore di innovazione, di inclusione e anche di nuova economia e di sviluppo sostenibile, lo dicevamo all'inizio. E questa è stata la prima cosa e da questa è nata la proposta eh, che abbiamo fatto e che all'inizio non aveva trovato la Commissione d'accordo, poi ce l'abbiamo fatta, dell'anno europeo dedicato al patrimonio culturale. Ci sono più di, eh, credo ormai siamo a 7.000 iniziative in tutta Europa, eh, mille più nel mio paese, ma sono soprattutto progetti transnazionali e anche un modo di rileggere il, la dimensione del patrimonio culturale anche attraverso, insieme alle altre direzioni generali. Credo che uno dei risultati più importanti che è stato fatto è nella governance di questo anno, che vede allo stesso tavolo i coordinatori nazionali dell'anno, gli stakeholders, che sono stati selezionati con un bando a livello europeo, e soprattutto, e anche, le, mi pare che siamo arrivati a 19 direzioni generali, direzioni generali della Commissione che prima, in un certo senso, diciamo, che consideravano una questione diversa e separata, no? nell'approccio dei silos, la, la, la dimensione culturale. Oggi c'è una sorta di gara, diciamo la verità, per cui c'è stata una conferenza a altissimo livello insieme, per la prima volta commissari della ricerca se ne parlava prima con eh, Cristian Greco, eh, della ricerca eh, patrimonio culturale e digitalizzazione che devono andare insieme non soltanto con la dimensione universitaria le istituzioni culturali sono titolari di ricerca, di innovazione e di educazione questo è un punto importante da acquisire abbiamo varato come abbiamo detto in, insieme sulla base di una comunicazione della Commissione questa nuova strategia inaugurata da Mogherini e Navracic insieme e sulla eh, cultura e l'educazione in tutte le eh, relazioni internazionali europee, quindi diventa un must inserire questo in tutte le relazioni internazionali, questo amplia lo sguardo. Abbiamo il nuovo programma Europa Creativa, di cui sono relatore, che ha ripercepito, devo riconoscerlo, nella, nella parte in particolare della cultura, nello strand cultura, molte delle proposte che abbiamo fatto, dando una specificità di attenzione alla musica, alla, al patrimonio culturale in, in senso lato, alla, eh, diciamo anche design e così via, ma anche a un eh, maggiore cross-sectoral diciamo, approach nel, nell'ambito disciplinare eccetera, e anche al nuovo programma di mobilità degli artisti, dei professionisti e degli operatori culturali. E l'altra grande questione è stata quella delle imprese culturali e creative di cui si è occupato in particolare Mo, il collega Morgano, cioè una vera strategia per inserirle pienamente eh, come uno dei settori più promettenti di nuovo lavoro, di nuovo investimento, di, di innovazione. Si parla ormai del 12% del PIL e di una quantità di, mi pare, circa 6 milioni e mezzo di, di, di lavoratori che sono in questo comparto. Ed è un comparto resiliente rispetto alla crisi, che vede anche una grande promettente incrocio col patrimonio culturale. Imprese culturali, innovazione e anche digitalizzazione sono una grande sfida. Perciò dobbiamo, noi abbiamo fatto le proposte di inserirli dentro Digital Europe, dentro U, eh, Europe Investments o Invest Europe e anche dentro la eh, Horizon 2020, che a volte è un po' distratto e dà poco spazio, troppo poco spazio, alla dynamic, alla cultura umanistica, alla eh, ricerca in campo culturale e all'applicazione e alla digitalizzazione anche della, 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 della cultura. Io non devo dire molto altro perché eh, chiaramente questo si lega a tutto ciò che abbiamo detto prima, educazione al patrimonio culturale e educazione alla cultura fanno parte integrante di una prospettiva culturale che non dimentichi eh, questa importantissima sfida che oggi abbiamo, in questo il, il progetto europeo si salverà se avrà, recupererà l'Europa una dimensione culturale di consapevolezza, di pensiero critico, di capacità di leggere la storia e i processi. Chiuso. Eh, a questo punto io penso che abbiamo messo sul tavolo insomma, un po' di spunti importanti e quindi credo che possiamo, vero Marco, dare la parola al primo eh, relatore, eh, che ringrazio per essere qui, ecco, <ride> ho sbagliato il foglietto, e che è eh, la eh, Rosa Perez Monclus, Senior Policy Officer di, Cult di Culture Action Europe, che voi immagino conosciate, anzi le facciamo i complimenti perché insomma, è, stato, è stato rinnovato anche il, il ecco, la vedevo, la vedevo era di qua, è stato rinnovato anche la presidenza e gli organi sociali ed è una rete di associazioni importanti, culturali, che, molto, molto interessanti, vivaci e ve la ringrazio perché avete anche dato un, un ottimo documento eh, per il programma Europa Creativa. Grazie.
Thank you, Ms. Costa, and thank you to the S&D group for inviting Culture Action Europe to this panel. It is true that you often don't have spaces to reflect on future cultural policy, but uh, I guess that to do so, we, not, we need to start by the present and to see what we have achieved uh, in the current legislature. A lot has happened, and you, as you have mentioned, we have celebrated the European Year of Cultural Heritage, we have a new proposal for Creative Europe, we have a new agenda for culture, and we have witnessed a battle over copyright uh, that uh, we've yeah, never I seen before. So, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if we start by the European Year of Cultural Heritage, what we have seen, it's a brave approach to include more intangible uh, heritage, living heritage, digital heritage, very important to approach it through a fair and ethical digitization of uh, cultural heritage. I can go a little bit more in detail if you want on this. And, uh, but maybe what uh, we have failed to do so is to be brave, to tackle um, those parts of our contested shared heritage. Because mm -hmm. uh, heritage can be a source of cohesion when uh, we approach it uh, critically and constructively. So this is perhaps something that we must ensure that goes on and lives on in the legacy of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, hand in hand with more traditional approaches uh, that relate to the built environment. We would absolutely agree that one of the um, successes of the year has been its governance model. So here what we would propose is to build upon it and expand it to the whole of the sector and beyond. Uh, this means that uh, we need to work more with our education uh, colleagues. We need uh, to work more with our colleagues in external relations. We need more STEAM. We need hybrid research. Uh, and in the face of Brexit, we also need to include uh, third countries. Why we need this new governance model, as it has been said before, because in a process of cultural mainstreaming that we all agree, we must say that we haven't been great at piloting the process inclusively. That means that when you look at the new generation of the next programs, you do not see a holistic coverage of all the cultural and creative sectors. Normally, either you have heritage or creative industries, but of course, this is just a fraction of the, of the whole sector. So uh, these governance structures could help, uh, could, could help to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one of the things that the parliament can do in the, next, uh, in the next parliament is to expand the CCI intergroup, the whole CCS, or, and work with other uh, committees since the beginning. This is especially important to avoid sectoral fragmentation because Culture Action Europe being a network of networks across all cultural sectors, it's quite easy to ask or to see the commonalities. So when you ask the cultural sector, what do you need from Europe? They tend to respond skills, data, mobility, mobility of cultural workers, but also of cultural works. And perhaps cultural works is one of the sector-specific uh, approaches that merit distribution schemes that are tailored to each one. Regarding data, just a word of caution, we are seeing an increasing divide between data-rich um, digital monopolies and data-poor cultural and public sector. There must be cooperation because they have information about our cultural consumption, our cultural practices. So let's please find a way to solve this when we, they have it and we need it in a way if we want to have uh, informed cultural policies. In the same approach, we need a balanced policy menu. This means that uh, we need uh, grants, financial guarantees, fiscal incentives. Yeah. So when you have all these policy tools available, then the issue of la labeling is not so important yeah. because everybody finds its window. What we need to do is to facilitate that the margins start working with the center. Why? Because most of the future cultural production is now being investigated, experimented in the fringes. 
So um, this will not be financed by financial intermediaries, will not be financed by the private sector. However, it is crucial for the whole of the innovation chain, not to mention the generation of uh, new knowledge or in itself intrinsic value. So that's why we need to start talking more about artistic research and creation in Creative Europe, but also in Horizon and beyond. Um, what else? We have an agenda for culture. We have, you can uh, keep brief, please. Yeah. Yeah. We have a new Creative yes, Europe yes. <laughs> program, yes, yes. offers continuity and uh, new proposals. We would just say, before we move forward, let's tackle the old problems. Let's really have a close look on how we can access, uh, facilitate access for microorganizations and increase um, our, um, yeah, our, uh, yeah, if co-financing rates and uh, endow it with resources. Just one last point. Uh, when we look into the future politically, we cannot escape that there is a new political landscape. Populism, Euroscepticism have started to use culture in a divisive way. And one way that it's contrary to the values of Europe here, one of the things that we have been warned and very concerned about is freedom of artistic expression. And I think, unfortunately, we have in the table some examples, practical examples of how this happens in the ground. So I will not go forward on this. And just I would uh, really ask for vigilance and monitoring at European level. Thanks. I'm totally in line with this proposal. Ah, voting, voting. is director of uh, Museo um, Egizio di Torino. You know that it's one of the largest, important ancient museum in, uh, Egyptian museum in, uh, in the second of the world, no? uh, first in Europe, uh, in, uh, according to this uh, subject. But, uh, but he is also very committed to enlarge and uh, enlarge the, 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 the audience and uh, also for migrants uh, of the for the for the museum, and he can explain how, which is the challenge uh, that are now the museum the systems in in Italy and Europe, but also this focus on uh, how to include uh, uh, in an educational way inside the activity of museum. Thank you, Christian. I would like to thank uh, Silvia Costa for being here. It's really a honor being here. Um, let me start just with a few sentences of, um, taken from an international uh, congress on museology and values which was held in Florence last September. And participants coming from all over Europe tried to define museums and they said, Museums change lives by inspiring engagement, reflection and debate, and links the experience to what Renaissance thinkers call the dignity of the person, seen as a component of integral human development. And um, in the diversity of our cultural expressions, museums invite an empathetic approach to differences, favoring openness and tolerance, hospitable, inclusive, and respectful, they fostered awareness of universal community and the conviction that what unites people is more important than what divides them. Museum turns memory words into dialogues and are part of the mechanism ensuring continuous human existence. And just to conclude, I would like to say that within the modern museological view, immigrants a part of our policy. And in that very document, we said immigrants must perceive museums as places of enfranchisement and venues of citizenship in which intercultural storytelling reveals unsuspected affinities. So, well, I would like uh, Professor Sasso this morning uh, really told us how education and children to become better citizens, but we should not forget the role of museums. Very often there is a divide 
between university of museum and we forget what museums are. Museums are not just the sum of objects kept in our showcases. Museums are made of people. Museums have uh, tangible and intangible heritage. The intangible heritage is the study of research made in centuries of the people who work there, which then pass on to newer generation. In this respect, we should uh, force uh, our country, I'm Italian, we should force Italy to approve the Convention of Faro and to uh, uh, preserve intangible cultural heritage. Museums then are cultural institutions and places where people can meet. They are the very basis of European identity. Before our objects, we are all citizens and we look at them in the same manner. Cultural heritage does not have boundaries. If I would like to define, for instance, Italian cultural heritage, where do I have to stop? Is uh, Leptis Magna in Libya? Italian cultural heritage, or is it super cultural heritage? So, well, the cultural heritage shows how boundaries are meaningless, how there should be mobility of people, how museum can be the new place okay. to form new citizens and to form new scholars. So, first of all, what I would like to ask, well, to have a recognition, to have museums recognized as a research center, to give the museums, in accordance with the university, the possibility to have fellows, to give ourselves PhDs and postdocs. People ask to be formed in the cultural heritage. They want to work hands-on. Museums can be the very place where the debate we were discussing this morning about humanities can come back. Because museums, by their, their very nature, they are multidisciplinary. So, for instance, very important questions that we have to ask, and I was very pleased to hear this morning already, to put humanities back into our agenda. We are talking about digitizing, digitization. We have to ask now where the children, which are not born yet, but they will be the decision maker in 20 years from now, what we will think about our cultural heritage? Will they think that we just can do a 3D model of everything and a 3D printing of a museum and close our museum and put everything in reserve? How do we render our museum socially sustainable? We are in a, a very um, changing world. I always make the comparison with Athens in the 5th century BC, where Socrates was uh, uh, battling in order to... Uh, um, defend oral tradition compared to uh, written tradition. But well, now we are going to the digital era and we have to ask ourselves how we can we preserve our cultural heritage, not just in saying there is a, a sacredness because something is ancient or there is a sacredness because it's original, because we lose the battle. We have to start talking about the biography of the objects. Every object has an biography. An archaeological object tells us about, especially my museum, I can say, tells us about what happened in the southern shore of the Mediterranean. When an object was used there thousands of years ago, when it was forgotten and he died, it was rediscovered by excavations, collecting, and is now the very source of our European identity. So how we do connect to new generation? How can we develop an innovative research with archaeological cultural heritage, not forgetting the landscape within Europe and, uh, and, uh, and, and how can we form citizens within our museum. So mobility of people, somehow also mobility of cultural heritage, and I really want to end with something that I experienced in Italy and in Holland because I'm myself the product of Erasmus and I'm very proud that I, I had an Erasmus that brought me to the Netherlands. I was supposed to stay there seven months and I ended up staying uh, 17 years. So I didn't have the post-Erasmus <laughs> trauma uh, because I grew up there. Uh, what um, is important, um, the museum, there is a National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden, uh, Museo Gizzoni in Turin, both form more or less in the same years, during 1824, late in 1826. In both museums, I find very important letters written to the kings in saying, our countries need to buy this collection from Egypt. 
only if we buy this collection we will be a great country. And in Italy, in 1819, Prospero Balbo wrote to the king of Sardinia, Italy did not exist at that moment, 42 years later we will be unified, and he said, you need to buy this collection. Only if Turing will buy this collection, Italy will be a great country, because we will have mm -hmm. the first uh, collection of antiquities in Rome, the first gallery in Florence, and the first Egyptian museum in Turing. We have to go back from there. And they gave 75% of the annual budget in order to buy the collection. Well, uh, needless to say that investment in culture by linking the culture with research and linking the culture with, uh, with forming the citizenship. And I would like to remember the Rex Museum in Amsterdam invited all the new elected member of the parliament to go to the Rex Museum to be formed as citizens. So please look at museum as place of research and place of continuing education started from very small children to scholars. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christian. Yeah. He Allora, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, so you are, you have uh, you are obliged now to to visit the Turin Museum of Egyptian Museum because it's a fantastic adventure. And the second uh, answer the question, I pray you to to refer of the, your your experience uh, to enlarge to migrants to Arabic uh, person because he is uh, also suffering for this uh, action now with the, the present government in Italy. And it's very important that his experience um, as, as a recalled. Now, uh, Ora, I give the floor to uh, Fran Franz Francois. Francois Matarasso, very known, uh, because he is a very, uh, has a very large experience in a community participatory uh, field. Uh, you are very a specialist on this, and uh, we are very proud to have you in uh, our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I start, I just want to say, it's, uh, for me, it's particularly important being here to affirm my sense of a European cultural identity as mm. somebody who's mm. living in a, in a nation which is turning its back on that. Thank you. We are with you. I, I've written something to try and keep to the five minutes, so forgive me if I read to you. In June 1976, a conference of European ministers with responsibility for cultural affairs was held in Oslo under the auspices of the Council of Europe. This gathering marked a turning point in European cultural policy because elected politicians began to consider culture not from the perspective of the state or even that of the artist, but from the point of view of the citizen. The conference delegates were from Western European nations that had integrated cultural policy into the post-war welfare state. They hoped to democratize culture by making it more accessible, but the limits of that approach had become clear during the cultural upheaval of the 1960s. The Oslo Conference sought a new path and it found it in cultural democracy. In the words of a preliminary report, cultural democracy implies placing importance on creating conditions which will allow people to choose to be active participants rather than just passive receivers of culture. This was a radical idea. It suggested that everyone was able to create art and that the difference between artists and other citizens was not of kind, but of degree. The achievements of great artists were not diminished by the minor ones of less gifted people, nor was the work of non-professional artists worthless because it did not reach those heights or even aspire to create in the same ways or for the same reasons. On the contrary, enlarging the frame of artistic legitimacy had the potential to enrich culture and bring unheard voices in from the margins. I want to read you two resolutions from the Oslo Conference. The first is that policy for society as a whole should have a cultural dimension, stressing the development of human values, equality, democracy, and the improvement of the human condition in particular by guaranteeing freedom of expression and creating real possibilities for making use of that freedom. 
the culture ministers also resolved that cultural policy can no longer limit itself exclusively to taking measures for the development, promotion, and popularization of the arts. An added dimension is now needed, which by recognizing the plurality of our societies, reinforces respect for individual dignity, spiritual values, and the rights of minority groups and their cultural expressions. Why raise these old ideas 40 years after the event? First, because I believe they remain valid and important. Culture is a common heritage and resource. It belongs equally to us all, and every citizen has the right to create it on her own terms within the democratic space where we negotiate our different beliefs and values. The primary task of cultural policy is to make that right a reality. Everything else, including the rights of artists, cultural education, protection of heritage, support for production, stands on that foundation. Secondly, I think cultural democracy matters because the social, economic, cultural, and technological revolution that we are living through is rapidly transforming the relationship of citizens to art and culture, empowering them to create, publish, share, and critique culture in ways that were unimaginable in 1976. Cultural democracy is happening all around us, and policy needs to understand that reality if it is to respond well to the consequences which it would be foolish to believe can only be good. The cultural interests of citizens are not always similar, nor are they necessarily synonymous with those of artists, cultural institutions, or commercial producers. The voice of minorities, specifically recognized in the Oslo resolutions, remains marginal, and those who cannot represent themselves in social space are always more vulnerable. It is only democracy with its faults and weaknesses that can help resolve these tensions and competing interests. Forty years after Oslo, Europe is a very different continent, facing equally different challenges. If culture is to be a source of strength rather than division, it will be because its elected representatives have found ways of making the principles and values of cultural democracy a reality for all citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very, very inspiring, these references to the cultural democracy and this uh, Oslo uh, uh, resolution that is very important and very not so ancient, no. huh? so, so contemporary, very useful. Also, the vote. Oh, <laughs> beautiful result. Many compliments. Many compliments. And so, uh, now I leave the floor to Anne Becker, Head of Policy and Public Affairs of uh, an Interactive Software Federation of Europe. You can ask uh, yourself, what is that? This is uh, also, we, last, we give the, the floor, we give the space in this debate also for the, some new uh, area of uh, cultural and audiovisual dimension that is also a, a video, video game. But uh, because uh, I, we discovered in the last year, because in the beginning I confessed that I, not, I was not so in favor of including video games in uh, Creative Europe, because we, we, that we are in, uh, a little filled with uh, ourselves, a little aristocratic, and this is the a game, only game, not. But, uh, but uh, we um, learned to appreciate uh, your commitment at the European level to culture dimension, a culture content uh, of this uh, new approach for video game, and maybe that uh, we can, uh, that's why I would like to, as a reporter, to reintroduce in the, in the framework of audiovisual and media strand also this aspect of, the, of uh, contemporary culture, but it's up to you to explain better what I try to say. Like, Thank you, Mrs. Costa, and thank you so much for, for inviting us to this uh, important uh, panel discussion uh, today. Uh, and we're, we're honored to be here also as part of, uh, we, we also consider us as being part of the uh, larger creative European industries, of course. 
ju just very briefly about ISFI, because many people, um, when you say the name, are, are not really sure what it represents. So as Mrs. Costa said, we represent the, the video games industry in Europe. Our membership covers uh, national trade associations across 18 European territories. And we also have uh, some direct video games companies being present as well. Yeah, is that good? Can you hear? It? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's it's the chair that's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so as I said, uh, video games today are, are part of Europe's uh, creative industries. It's uh, it's also a sector that is bringing a lot of growth to Europe. Uh, in 2017, the European revenue from our sector represented around 20 billion euros. Uh, we have around 50% of the European population that are playing video games today. That's around 250 million people. Uh, I think the, uh, the typical stereotype when you speak about video gamers today, uh, no, you can say that that no longer longer applies. The fastest growing age group is the age group between 45 and 64 years old. 50% uh, of the gamers are, are women. Uh, so it's, it's something that today is, uh, is part of our society and has a broad impact across, across various sectors. Video games, I would just like to spend very brief moment on, on to explain a little bit of, of, of video games, what it's made of. It's, it's created by teams of highly skilled, talented and creative people. Uh, the software element that describes the interactivity of the game that makes it a game that makes it interactive. But it's much more than software. Uh, you have uh, very large creative teams uh, that are involved in the development of, of a video game. You have visual elements, you have sound elements, you have highly elaborated narrative uh, storytelling, uh, which also brings with it new things such as immersive storytelling. Um, and it's this mix of technology and I would say artistry that is uh, spurs also this creative and immersive innovation. And uh, we can see that uh, there is a lot of innovation happening in, in the sector. And we see how this is also spilling over to the other culture sectors, such as art, fashion, cinema, music. Uh, video games are now also part of library collections. Uh, we were very pleased to, pardon? Uh, yeah, museums, yeah. There are special video game museums as well, as, as Mrs. Costa is indicating. And we were very pleased to, to actually be part of the, uh, of the Cultural Heritage Conference in June that was organized by President Tajani. And we had an exhibition on video games and cultural heritage. Uh, but I think this is also about uh, breaking silos. C culture needs to break silos. Uh, you need to interact with, with different sectors, also within the creative sectors, but also beyond. Uh, we see that uh, we have a lot of innovation in video games that is spilling over to completely different sectors. Uh, the virtual worlds that are created within video games are often used as test beds, for instance, for artificial intelligence uh, in order to, to test in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, digital, in this, um, in this uh, made up world applications that will then be released later on in the real world. So it is a good test bed uh, that, that goes well beyond the pure video games sector. Uh, we had a presentation in the European Parliament recently how uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, works in the field of game development. Uh, I think we're a bit surprised by the very high attendance at this breakfast meeting, but it, uh, it triggered a great debate. Uh, we have decided to make that presentation available on our website. I think that many people that attended that... Pardon? Yeah. Uh, they felt that they n now have a bit of, of knowledge of, of artificial intelligence as well. In order to, 
what's important for us, I think, but, but for the bro broader creative sec sectors is, of course, that Europe remains uh, this fantastic hub of diversity, of creation f for culture. Um, for that, uh, specifically, we, we believe, and we have heard this today, but I would like to, to indicate that again, and that is that the skills agenda really needs to be properly promoted. We would like to see coding capabilities coming in at the, uh, in the national curricula in, in Europe. We, we support and we see the efforts of the European Commission and the European Parliament around the EU Code Week. Uh, around the EU Digital Ac Education Action Plan. Uh, all those measures are really important and, and they need to, to continue. Something that is also important in this, uh, in this digital world today is, of course, media literacy. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, is media literacy. Uh, and we believe it's, it's important there to, to, to promote that further, especially in the digital environment. And finally, and this is my last point, uh, we, we need incentives that to support the development of video games, whether that is at European level, through the Creative Europe media program, through various policies, but importantly, this also needs to happen at national level through various incentives, whether that is through policy or, or tax incentives. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, recall, um, I want just to recall that inside Creative Europe we stress a lot Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, right. can you vote, see again? vote, vote, sorry. Vote and send then to the Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, put in a, in a, in a very uh, in a better uh, uh, strong strong way uh, the media literacy. Uh, maybe also um, coding, maybe yeah. can be uh, recogniz recognizable. Uh, competence on this and uh, absolutely I share that the uh, um, digital action plan uh, for us must be uh, more focused also on uh, cultural and uh, audiovisual competence and so I agree. Thank you so much. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Roberto Honorable, Roberto Rampi, Senator and uh, National Responsible for Culture the Department of Cal Democratic Party in my country. It's up to you, Roberto. Sì, eh, innanzitutto mi scuso per parlare in italiano, ma ci ho pensato molto e alla fine ho deciso di, di farlo perché credo che ci sia anche un tema no, di differenza linguistica che dobbiamo provare a, a valorizzare, anche se eh, ho sentito oggi con piacere tanti connazionali parlare un ottimo inglese, e quindi così smentiamo anche questa idea un po' degli italiani. Io vorrei focalizzarmi su due punti, partendo dal ringraziamento sincero molto forte a Silvia per il lavoro che ha fatto in questi anni, lei e tutto il gruppo socialista, ma sappiamo tutti, è democratico, ma sappiamo tutti che Silvia ha fatto un lavoro particolare in questo campo e ha dato un risalto, una dimensione agli investimenti culturali europei che, di cui avevamo veramente bisogno e per l'invito a, a questo confronto che è stato già fino ad ora un confronto di, di grandissima qualità, quindi credo ci siano moltissimi spunti. Io credo che noi dobbiamo avere molto chiaro quali battaglie abbiamo davanti, abbiamo davanti una serie di battaglie che vanno tutte insieme. La prima battaglia è una battaglia per il valore della cultura. A che cosa serve la cultura? Eh, la cultura... Noi abbiamo combattuto in questi anni contro tutti quelli che pensano che la cultura sia un investimento elitario, un surplus, qualche cosa eh, di aggiuntivo, un, un orpello, magari anche un bellissimo oggetto, un bellissimo eh, gioiello no? che ci si può permettere nei tempi di vacche grasse, però poi quando vengono i tempi di vacche magre, beh, allora eh, lì bisogna andare a tagliare. No? E questa è un'idea pericolosa, sbagliata, che hanno ancora in molti, dobbiamo saperlo. Qui abbiamo visto in quasi sempre tanti foglietti verdi, siamo tutti d'accordo, ma non dobbiamo illuderci, perché noi siamo tutti d'accordo, ma siamo pochi ad essere tutti d'accordo. E là fuori ce ne sono molti che non sono d'accordo con noi. C'è un'idea emergente che io condivido della cultura come un grande eh, strumento economico, come un grande filone di impresa, come un grande filone di crescita 
eh, che fornisce posti di lavoro. È vero, io ho combattuto e combatto culturalmente e poi fattivamente nelle norme l'idea che la cultura vada preservata e tenuta lontana dal denaro, come se fosse qualcosa di angelico che viene spostato se si incontra con il denaro. Va combattuta questa idea. Però noi non investiamo in cultura solo perché è un settore economico e industriale. Non è quello il motivo. Il motivo per cui noi dobbiamo investire in cultura è che la cultura è la chiave della democrazia. Tu hai ricordato l'Atene del V secolo. La democrazia è nata lì ed è nata in un luogo dove si era deciso che i cittadini dovevano andare a teatro. Era obbligatorio. Tu non eri cittadino se non andavi a teatro. Era una cosa impensabile. E naturalmente il teatro è uno dei simboli, ma potrebbe valere per un museo, potrebbe valere per una biblioteca e potrebbe valere per un videogioco. Poi su questo eh, dirò qualcosa in più. Io sono convinto che la chiave della democrazia sia la cultura e che la scommessa democratica, che è un fattore... Nuovo, una cosa che ci siamo inventati, no? diciamo, attorno in un certo senso al Settecento, in un certo senso all'Ottocento, ma in realtà nel secondo Novecento, perché la democrazia piena come la conosciamo è un fatto veramente recente, eh? Eh, si basa su un fondamento che è la diffusione culturale. Se non c'è la diffusione culturale, se non c'è il pensiero critico, se non c'è la funzione dell'arte, dell non solo della cultura del logos, non solo della cultura... Non c'è la democrazia. E guardate, lo dico qui oggi, perché noi siamo esattamente in questo cono d'ombra. Noi abbiamo iniziato a perdere la diffusione culturale e stiamo perdendo la democrazia. Oggi sono presenti due attiviste dei diritti umani con cui stiamo facendo tanti lavori insieme. Lo dico perché noi stiamo combattendo per lo Stato di diritto, per i diritti umani in giro per il mondo, in Europa in particolare, ma questa battaglia è innanzitutto una battaglia culturale, perché se la minoranza delle persone pensa che lo Stato di diritto e i diritti umani siano importanti, noi possiamo fare una battaglia straordinaria, ma la facciamo da elite. Noi dobbiamo ricoinvolgere il popolo e il popolo lo coinvolgono gli artisti, lo coinvolgono i pensatori, i sognatori, quelli che fanno vivere, che fanno sognare. Io ti ho ascoltato sui musei, io ho avuto la grandissima fortuna nella mia esperienza di vice sindaco assessore della cultura di aprire un museo nella mia piccola città che è Vimercate e nel mio museo succedono due cose la prima si inizia con una sala delle origini e si scopre che le origini in una cittadina vicino a Milano sono una sepoltura dove c'è una ragazza di origini slave e un piatto che viene dall'Algeria perché queste sono le nostre origini non è che ce lo siamo inventati e bisogna dirlo, perché le origini sono migrazioni e permanenze, uso questo nome, che è il nome della prima mostra che abbiamo fatto in quel museo, migrazioni e permanenze. Uh -huh. Perché poi, voglio dire, noi siamo a un passo da Mediolanum, lo si capisce, no? se uno ha un po' di passione per i nomi, capisce che Mediolanum è un luogo che si muove, no? è un luogo che, si, che incrocia i fatti. E chiudo dicendo questo, questa battaglia, e Silvia lo ha capito molto bene, io le sono veramente grata, è una, è una battaglia politica che va fatta anche dentro i nostri partiti, dentro al gruppo socialista e democratico e deve essere la battaglia principale di tutti gli europeisti l'anno prossimo. Cioè noi dobbiamo fare in modo che la cultura sia il nostro primo impegno, perché se si fa la battaglia culturale si vince anche la battaglia della solidarietà, la battaglia antirazzista, la battaglia antifascista e la battaglia del lavoro, della giustizia e dell'uguaglianza. Se, se non ci sono le, 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 se non c'è la dimensione culturale questa battaglia non si vince. Noi rischiamo di fare delle battaglie di retroguardia. Noi dobbiamo tornare ad essere affascinanti. E questa, secondo me, è la parola chiave. No? Qualcuno direbbe erotici, lo dice Luigi Berlinguer. Eh, e, e per questo io, e chiudo davvero, ho alzato il foglietto giallo all'inizio del panel precedente, l'unico caso in cui l'ho fatto, ma poi mi avete convinto nel panel precedente, perché l'educazione è fondamentale, però l'educazione deve incontrare l'arte deve incontrare tutti i luoghi della cultura e deve diventare, appunto, come dice Luigi, erotica. Sì. Cioè non è un dovere andare a scuola. Andare a scuola è un piacere, è un fascino straordinario. E noi dobbiamo tornare ad agganciare i ragazzi e le ragazze a questa dimensione valoriale. Se l'Europa ha ancora una funzione nel mondo, ha questa funzione qua. E io credo che questa debba essere la nostra principale battaglia. Grazie. Beh, it's not a better conclusion than this. Allora, voti, voti.
meno male. Oh, that's a good sign. This, uh, adesso andiamo a convincere to, gli altri. Have to take a of this boat, eh? so, adesso, dobbiamo, sì, adesso dobbiamo convincere gli altri. No? We have to convince the others. And so thank you so much, uh, Roberto. I totally take in consideration your proposal. Uh, your, um, is also my, my, my personal de um, deep uh, uh, thought that we have to consider culture the basis of uh, The, of, not only of, of democracy, but also of the, our battle for Europe. And that's so connected. And the educational and cultural dimension of uh, Europe project is uh, at the core mm, of the new, of the possibility to, to, to look at the future. And uh, also as uh, our, our first, um, colleague, uh, as uh, Julie and you recall before, Uh, when you say uh, culture, we, we, we want to maintain, to continue to have this cultural bridge independently eh, of what happens in Brexit. But uh, I know that um, more and more of complaints of uh, terrible worry about Brexit to, uh, to, to us come from university, culture, artists, and uh, students. Uh, Erasmus and so on, they feel themselves lo lost because for them it's normal the European dimension, and to share a common culture also in, the, the, in diversity. And that's a, a very terrible, but also important message that we received by you, and thank you for your words at the beginning. And so. Okay, um, so we have the session until, supposed to be until 12.15, but we got the, the extension to 12.30 because there is also another event after. So it means we have still 20 minutes for some interventions from MP, uh, other MEPs that are here in the first uh, row as well, uh, the European Commission. So I would like maybe to start uh, with you because there have been already several ideas. Uh, so maybe you could make a first reaction. Uh, today we have um, um, Barbara, for, that is the head of unit for Creative Europe, the European Commission, and as well Gabriele Bertoli, policy officer for audiovisual industry and media support programs, also from the European Commission. So maybe some in, in initial thoughts on what has been said in the panel. Then we can see if somebody, there is additional question uh, for you. I don't know, sorry, I don't know the time that you have because, echo. sorry, can we change a little because also is be better also the Commission also replies to leave, yes. also to the, our maps because they are just maybe in a hurry. I would like that uh, uh, now we can give the floor before to uh, Georgios Grammaticatis. If, uh, as if we have the issue with time, we can also... The European Agenda for Culture and uh, also uh, Julia and then uh, Diotti, but we can also alternate eh, a little. Okay, okay. so let's before, then... Uh, uh, before okay. Georgios... So let's then uh, uh, go with the uh, other MEPs and then uh, the people yeah, yeah. from the Commission you can okay. answer, It's then we can get the ping-pong at the end. Dialogue. Okay. Ε, νομίζω, νομίζω ότι είναι εξαιρετικά σημαντική. Sorry. Yes. No, no, Greek. I prefer Greek. Yeah. Άρχισα να λέω ότι είναι πολύ σημαντική η σημερινή μέρα και οι δύο, οι δύο πλευρές της. Εγώ ομολογώ εντυπωσιάστηκα από τις συζήσεις. Με δυσκόλυψε μόνο ότι όλοι ψηφίζαμε πράσινο. Ήθελα κάποιες αντιρρήσεις. Ε, δεν κατάλαβα γιατί δεν υπήρχαν αντιρρήσεις. Εγώ θα εκφράσω μερικές ήπιες και καλόπιστες αντιρρήσεις σε όσα ακούσαμε. Από την κυρία Περέζ πρώτα-πρώτα, δεν κατάλαβα τι σημαίνει ολιστική κάλυψη. Ολιστική κάλυψη ίσως σημαίνει και πτώση της ποιότητας. Είναι πολύ δύσκολο ο πολιτισμός να περιλαμβάνει οτιδήποτε υπαρκτό σε αυτή τη δύσμηρη γη. Αυτό που με εντυπωσίασε όμως την πολύ ωραία εισηγησή σα ήταν ότι κάνατε τη δήλωση ότι αυξάνονται οι διαφορές στην πρόσβαση, το οποίο επειδή είναι πάρα πολύ σοβαρό θα ήθελα αν γίνεται να μου το δικαιολογήσετε. Η δεύτερη εισήγηση από τον κύριο Γκρέκο ήταν εξαιρετική υπεράσπιση του ρόλου των μουσείων μέχρι που κι εγώ πίστηκα να επισκεφθώ τα μουσεία που δεν έχω πάει ποτέ στη ζωή μου, ε, βάσει της συγγύσεώς σας. Ε, δεν κατάλαβα όμως πώς θα ενσωματωθούν, κάπως έτσι είπατε, οι μετανάστες. Εγώ από ό,τι ξέρω τα προβλήματα των μεταναστών είναι πολύ μεγάλα και το τελευταίο που σκέφτονται ίσως είναι να επισκεφθούν ένα μουσείο. Και το να επανέλθουν οι ανθρωπιστικές επιστήμες 
στη παλιά τους, βέβαια συμφωνούμε όλοι. Η, η δική μας όμως εποχή είναι πάρα πολύ δύσκολη για αυτή την επάνωδο. Ο κύριος Ματαράσο, αν λέω σωστά τα ονόματα, μας θύμισε και ήταν πάρα πολύ ωραίο τη διάσκεψη του Όσλο διότι επιβεβαίωσε την δική μου μικρή αντίληψη ότι καμιά φορά η ανθρωπότητα πάει προς τα πίσω. Δηλαδή η διάσκεψη του Όλσο ήταν πολύ προχωρημένη, το δικαιολογήσατε κι εσείς, ενώ σήμερα όπως είπατε με τη λέξη είναι μια άλλη ήπειρος η Ευρώπη. Εγώ ελπίζω να το ξεπεράσει και αυτό το σημείο, σε αυτό νομίζω συμφωνούμε όλοι. Εγώ σηκώνω το πράσινο να ξεπεράσει η Ευρώπη τη σημερινή της κρίση. Πρώτη φορά που το κάνουμε τόσο ενθουσιασμό. Και θα πάω λίγο στην Άννα Μπέικερ, διότι με εξέπληξε, με την καλή έννοια. Εγώ ποτέ δεν είχα σκεφτεί, ε, είμαι καταδικασμένος από τη ζωή, να μην έχω παίξει ούτε μία φορά βίντεο game. Ούτε μία φορά. Και εδώ είπατε κάτι νούμερα που ομολογώ ότι εντυπωσιάστηκα. 50% των Ευρωπαίων είπατε συμμετέχουν, και μάλιστα από αυτό 50% είναι γυναίκες. Επειδή είναι πολύ υπερβολικά αυτά, θα ήθελα ή δυνατόν να, να μας το δικαιολογήσετε. Ε, είπατε ότι είναι τμήμα δημιουργικής βιομηχανίας, το οποίο συμφωνώ, αλλά διαφωνώ τελείως σε αυτό που είπατε να δοθούν κίνητρα, διότι όλοι θέλουν κίνητρα για όλα τα πράγματα. Νομίζω η βιομηχανία, το βίντεο είναι αρκετά ανθυρή, έτσι τουλάχιστον νομίζω, και απλώς πρέπει να καλυτερεύσει την ποιότητά της, που ομολογώ για τρίτη φορά ότι δεν την ξέρω. Είμαι ακαλλιέργητος, απολύτως, στα βίντεο. Ε, η τελευταία εισήγηση ήταν μαχητική και γι' αυτό μου άρεσε, από τον κύριο Ράμπη. Είπε πολλές φορές ότι έχουμε μάχες να δώσουμε, μαζί σας είμαι κύριε Ράμπη, για τις μάχες αυτές. Ευτυχώ αποφύγατε την σύγχυση που γίνεται συνήθως να ταυτίζεται η οικονομία με τον πολιτισμό, το δικαιολογήσατε, το, το είπατε μάλιστα ότι δεν πρέπει να γίνει αυτός ο σκοπός και μου άρεσε πάρα πολύ η φράση του Μπερλίνγκου, εγώ δεν ξέρω τι το έχει πει, ότι να είμαστε εγωιτευτικοί. Επειδή εγώ δεν νομίζω ότι είμαι καθόλου εγωιτευτικός, θα σταματήσω εδώ και ευχαριστώ πολύ για την προσοχή σας. Μπράβο, Γιώργιος. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, two of you would like to speak now, right? Sorry. Εάν υπάρχει χρόνος μπορώ να πω και δύο κουβέντες για την ατζέντα, νέα ατζέντα για τον πολιτισμό. Πολύ γρήγορα. Ε, σύ. Ναι. Ασουτομήτε σύ. Absolutely. Νομίζω ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό και κατά κάποιο τρόπο ενθαρρυντικό ότι η Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή προσπαθεί να καταρτήσει μια μακροχρόνια ιδέα και μακροχρόνια διαδικασία για τον πολιτισμό. Τα σημεία της βέβαια είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικά, αλλά τίποτα από αυτά δεν θα γίνει. Δίδε χρημάτων έλεγαν οι αρχαίοι Έλληνες, χρειάζονται χρήματα. Οι προτάσεις μας είναι να ενισχυθούν οικονομικά όλοι οι τομεί του πολιτισμού, αλλά επαναλαμβάνω γιατί δεν υπάρχει χρόνο να το αναλύσω, ότι η νέα ατζέντα για τον πολιτισμό είναι για πρώτη φορά <laughs> θα συμφωνήσετε ένας πολύ καλός οδηγός για μια καλύτερη Ευρώπη. Mm -hmm. Δεν θέλω να πω τίποτα άλλο. Thank you very much. Uh... There it goes. Um, first of all, um, I will maybe address some of the different points that came up. But um, I wonder if you're aware that I was the first MEP apprentice um, for museums. I, there was a film of me spending a whole day in um, the museum in Maastricht. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name temporarily. But I was in the Culture Center in Maastricht for a whole day a really beautiful little museum and art center where I took part in everything, including locking the place up at the end of the day, serving behind the counter. And uh, it is a great initiative of NEMO to um, 
get politicians and policymakers to really be right in, in the museum itself, learning behind the scenes. I was doing some, you know, some renovation, some conservation. I was doing all sorts of things. So um, it's also fun for us, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we just in here all the time, but we have to be in the real world. And the real world is not just our constituencies. The real world is also in the cultural institutions that we are trying to defend when we're making policy, when we're putting forward amendments, when we're fighting for the money. So um, I would advise all of you to look at that program, to look at that little film, to get it out there and to try and encourage other um, MEPs in the future to do what I did. Um, but I want to go on from that because um, arts and culture can happen in many, many different spaces. And that really wasn't talked very much about, about these other spaces. Libraries are a great space for arts and culture. And our libraries are under attack. Certainly in the UK, um, austerity measures have meant that many libraries had to shut down. And um, we, have so, we have a very good um, proactive libraries for EU advocacy group here that Ilona Kish runs. But we are seeing back in our own countries um, a, real, uh, a real close down of these open common spaces where people can come together. I would say safe spaces. The libraries uh, that I know about in the UK are open for people who are homeless. They're open for people who can't afford to put their heating on. And while they're in these library spaces, they can participate in a whole range of really interesting um, uh, activities that are using incredible archives and resources. So we have to talk about other spaces. And when we're talking about other spaces, we have to talk about the outdoors too. And I was really proud that um, I, uh, I, S&D, one of the other conferences that S&D promoted with m uh, my support was a conference about outdoor arts and how outdoor arts in itself is a way of um, us addressing lots and lots of different agendas. So let's talk about all those other spaces. And while we're talking about other spaces, we have to recognize also that the right wing, the extremists, uh, they want to shut down these common spaces, okay? They're very afraid of what might happen in these open spaces where arts and culture becomes a tool for exploration, where we have open-ended questions. We don't necessarily know the answers, but we trust the process through creating Creativity to give us um, genuine uh, answers to things, maybe new answers, things we never thought about before. So I think we've got to really advocate for these other spaces. Um, I think we also have to advocate, we have to talk about expanding the definition of what arts and culture is, because sometimes we're talking about very, very narrow definitions. And for me, and that's why it's great to have the video games people here, but you know, street arts, uh, there's all kinds of different uh, ways of expressing yourself, which people never thought was culture before, or they don't think is culture. But we need to be more expansive and more inclusive, not less. Um, I just want to say something about media because in the new culture agenda what was missing uh, was media, media freedom and I had a conversation with somebody from the commission about it and they said oh well it, it's implicit, it's not good enough anymore for things to be implicit they have to be explicit we have to make things explicit particularly where we know our freedoms are going to be under attack we have to say this really matters it's so important that we um, support our, our media, our journalists, and you know, um, in every way, we have to be thinking about quality. I was waving this every time because I thought it was a bit like bitter if I didn't wave the green every time. But every time I waved it, I wanted to put the word quality in front of it because education failed me. So I, you know, I had access to education, but I failed it all. It didn't suit me. So, <laughs> so having quality education and having alternative education and thinking about uh, and not putting um, education into the box where we're just going to make it a market, uh, a market product is really important for me. So all those things, in a way, need to be qualified when we talk about them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We go as well for yeah. you. Okay. Daniele Viotti. Uh, just a moment, just to check the timing. Yeah. How are we are timing? Do we have a, another and meeting after we this can one? Give the floor we have, yes. Barbara. Okay, so if we can, yes, and then we can go to the commission okay. after, yes. Dai Daniele, thank you uh, for being here. Grazie, io ringrazio Silvio perché 
occupandomi di bilancio anche gli eventi a cui partecipo qui in Parlamento paralleli al lavoro sono sempre eventi legati al bilancio di una aridità unica stamattina veramente partecipare a questo evento è come bere un bicchiere d'acqua dopo aver mangiato sabbia per tutta la settimana ehm, due considerazioni eh, molto molto veloci eh, che attengono anche però al, al mio lavoro in commissione bilancio eh, io sono convinto che questo dibattito surreale a cui assistiamo in Europa ormai da alcune settimane, alcuni mesi, su questo sono molto d'accordo con, con Roberto Rampi, eh, su europeismo, anti-europeismo, euroscettici, euroconvinti, eh, sovranisti, eh, eh, contro gli europeisti, eccetera, abbia una sola risposta possibile, che non è quella di contrapporsi agli anti-europeisti con un europeismo di facciata, ma l'unica risposta possibile è quella della politica e delle politiche. Fare politiche, tornare a fare politiche e tornare a fare politiche. Cioè avere un'Europa che torna a occuparsi dei cittadini. E in particolare, eh, siccome voglio essere veloce, naturalmente credo capiate tutti quel che voglio dire, in particolare dei giovani, puntando moltissimo sulle, sulle giovani generazioni. Eh, io partecipa Guardate, ci sono due temi che sono fondamentali nella nostra, nel nostro dibattito, nel, nel futuro dell'Europa. Uno sono eh, il lavoro, l'altro sono le politiche sociali di cui doveva farsi carico l'Europa. Dico il lavoro perché voglio, in 20 secondi, vi racconto questo aneddoto che mi è capitato con Paola Matossi, che è la, in un incontro che ha avuto Paola Matossi, la, credo sia la responsabile di comunicazione del, del Museo Egizio, a Torino, si parlava di giovani, innovazione, quella, e un imprenditore di cui non faccio il nome diceva che lui era contentissimo di avere dei ragazzi avrebbe aperto un sacco e mezzo di attività eccetera e avrebbe assunto tutti i ragazzi con la terza media per dare un'opportunità di lavoro ai ragazzi con la terza media bene, Paola Matossi e io molto più modestamente invece ci siamo ribellati a quest'idea perché va benissimo che ci sia lavoro per, per tutti per tutte e per tutti ma la nostra idea è quella di dare cultura ed educazione a tutte e tutti il fatto che ci possa essere un lavoro per un ragazzo di terza media non vuol dire che questo non possa accedere a un percorso educativo o a un percorso culturale. Quindi su questo bisogna assolutamente eh, puntare. E così come l'idea di istituire un, il, un, progetto, sì, un progetto di Child Guarantee in Europa, in cui, che è un progetto del nostro gruppo, in cui vogliamo garantire i bambini, eccetera, e battere la povertà, combattere la povertà, non significa semplicemente combattere la povertà dal punto di vista dei beni primari, del mangiare e del coprirsi, ma i beni primari sono anche la cultura, e sono anche, sono anche educazioni e sono anche la cultura. In fondo, infine, eh, anch'io sono con, convinto che non bisogna legare economia a cultura, eccetera, la cultura è un investimento al di là che non, che non abbia un ritorno diretto diretto eh, economico ma ha un senso politico per noi perché se noi torniamo a ad avere un'Europa che è capace di investire sull'educazione e sulla cultura torniamo all'Europa delle radici e torniamo all'Europa dei valori che è l'unico modo per contrapporsi ai disvalori di chi l'Europa vuole distruggere. Grazie. Thank you very much. Then I would then now go to finally to the European Commission. As I already uh, uh, said before, Barbara is with us here as well, and as well, Gabriele. So if, there are a lot of issues, so please, uh, if you can answer in a very short time, I know it's a challenging moment for you, but that's uh, the life of commission usually, yeah, what we can do. So. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, and. Uh, i think it's fair to say that uh, I have also been very inspired uh, by all of the interventions on the panel and also the interventions uh, from from MEPs. And this is not this is not now the place to justify what we have proposed, but uh, just a couple of words on how how we see uh, how at least the program that we have presented uh, in May and also uh, the new agenda for culture are actually in line with a lot of what you have uh, presented today, but I think some of it can actually be more 
uh, more forcefully uh, still be figuring in our proposals, and this is why I'm grateful, and it comes really timely, uh, this, uh, this meeting. As you know, we have proposed uh, to, to, to uh, increase the budget. We're very happy uh, that the Commission decided to increase the budget, which is already a good sign. Uh, I hope you will agree with us. It can always be more, but it actually already shows that the Commission has read the signs uh, saying uh, culture has not only an economic role, it has an intrinsic value that's very obvious, but it also has a role for society and it has a role for resilience of individuals. We have to raise uh, also cultural participation and I was very intrigued also by what you said, how cultural uh, participation is actually also changing in the light of the digital ecosystem that we are currently living in, uh, because that actually uh, is, is one of the main new roles that we see uh, no, it's not a new role, it's an old role that you have, you, the culture world, have always told us has existed, but has now, I think, been explicitly, explicitly taken up also uh, at the European level. Uh, not, not, of course, to neglect uh, what you said, uh, Mrs. Costa, in the beginning, also that there's also an economic role, obviously. We must not neglect this. Uh, the, the, the jobs and the growth aspect of culture remain important because in the end also artists need to be making a living uh, and uh, some money needs to be put into culture in order also to make our creative sectors resilient in this new globalized uh, environment. So, uh, which is why we have both aspects, both in the new agenda for culture, but also in the Creative Euro program, the economic aspect of culture, but also the overall cultural diversity and linguistic diversity objective of the program. Um, and uh, what we have proposed, uh, I think, relates very much to what you said, Rosa, also in the beginning, uh, the mobility fund that we have introduced. We are also currently looking into ways of also increasing not only cooperation, which is the heart of the current program, but needs to be strengthened and continued, but also looking maybe into other ways of making cultural works circulate, not only the people, but also the works after they have been uh, after they have been supported this is something that we're currently looking into and uh, as the chair said in her introduction we are also strengthening under creative europe and in the agenda because there's a first time really agenda uh, means P a political program now aligned with the money that should go with it. So we are really on the same footing here, which is something that makes us proud, uh, and uh, we hope to be able to achieve it. But as you said, Mrs. Costa, there's also alignment with the international relations. For the first time ever, we will be able uh, also to, to be more active in this, in this respect. And um, you have all said that more... Uh, that more openness needs to be made towards other programs and there needs to be clearer flagging of culture and creativity in the other programs. We are, of course, fighting for this. I know you don't like the word synergy so much, but what this program has done is it's actually built in some hooks where other programs can bring in the money to do exactly what we want to do. And this is, I think, uh, a real opening for... Uh, for, for the sector to actually get more money in uh, uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of, of its development. So um, I'm going to be short because I want to give the floor also to, uh, to, to Gabriele. Um, but uh, I want to reassure you that uh, we're also looking very much now, between now and the end of 2020, into how to implement and to make the program even better. We're now discussing the legal base, as you know, but we are, of course, in parallel also looking to to improve the accessibility of the program, and we've heard the message. Uh, we are now already dedicating 40% of the budget to a smaller project, but we need to find a good and probably a better balance uh, of accessibility for smaller and larger organizations. We know there's a need out there to be raising co-funding 
mechanisms, and this is what we're actively working on, uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're obviously uh, promoting this process in parallel to the discussions on the legal base. And I'm happy to say also what we heard about video games and also what we heard about um, artificial intelligence, for example, also to be used in museums. This kind of concrete aspects, how digitization also creates opportunities, not only for the creators, but also for young and older people. You know, it could be my target group, you know, women of around a certain age. We don't necessarily do this enough. There's business models also that can be developed. And we have under the cross-sectoral strand of the new program specifically <coughs> opened what we call the innovation labs where such projects should be promoted and we're actively also always looking for good examples and good advice on how exactly such projects could look like. So the openness from our side is there and we'll take a lot of inspiration from uh, from this uh, from this debate, including also uh, from the politicians. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Just a moment. I want just to thank you. The, the thanks the, the interpreters. But now we continue in English because the the the, the, the hour is dead. But we have also at least uh, uh, 15 minutes. We can stay 15. 15 minutes. More. We can stay okay. 15 minutes. Please yes. Please to Gabriele. Thank you very much. Well, I can only echo what, uh, what Barbara said. Uh, and I would just like to add a couple of points. Uh, the good thing is that Creative Europe is a silo-free program in the sense that Barbara and, and my department, so the audiovisual and media one, cooperate on a daily basis. I see Barbara more often than my family now, which is good because it means that Creative Europe is truly about all uh, culture and creative sectors, including audiovisual, uh, and it covers them in an holistic way indeed. Um, I would like also to react to what, to what uh, Mrs. Ward and also Mrs. Becker said uh, concerning media, uh, media literacy and media freedom and pluralism. You will, you will know that in the last years we have funded as European Union those actions in those fields through pilot projects and preparatory actions thanks to the uh, commitment of the Parliament. But these have proven to be a bit uh, unstable in their financing because, of course, they get renewed every year. So we have decided to embed them into the cross-sectoral strand of the next Creative Europe program, which we believe is um, deep, uh, of deep importance because we give them more financial stability so they can run their actions uh, in a better way. And also we have ad added much more money in our proposal to what they usually got through the parliament. So I hope that this helps. Uh, it doesn't cover everything, of course, because uh, as, you can, as, as we all know, the situation is not easy in Europe, but I think it could give an important helping hand. Um, also, for the budget, 30% uh, plus 30% for the, whole, for the whole program, we count on Mr. Viotti to, uh, to fight for it, and we take note of what Mr. Greco said about the importance of public resources for culture. I would just like to close um, on a note uh, reacting to you, uh, Mrs. Costa, uh, what you said at the beginning about the importance of the ancillary but also intrinsic value of culture. And it came, uh, the movie um, Pride came into my mind at the moment. It's a movie that we funded through Creative Euro Media a few years ago. And uh, in, that, in that movie, um, Welsh workers were asking and singing for uh, bread and roses. So they wanted bread, sustainability, of course, for their life, but they also wanted the roses, uh, the culture, uh, the freedom of expression, to have like uh, to, to live life in, uh, in in at its fullest, and we believe that through Creative Europe, we do what we can to give to give people not just the bread but also the roses. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have shared this approach, uh, bread and roses approach. I totally <laughs> agree. And so we have just uh, one minute because uh, uh, I imagine we have more time. But they say that it's not that there is also people uh, waiting. And so if you, Georgios, want to to add one word on uh, uh, European uh, agenda, sorry. And the other question, we can go out and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in direct way, in a friendly way to answer to also illustrate the experience that he, that he have done with the migrants. Please. No, we, we don't have uh, time for much. Uh, I only say that the new agenda for culture is very important because it tries to cover all aspects of civilization 
And it was really very good that we had today this uh, opening and these rapporteurs because that encouraged our, our effort to do the best uh, for Europe and for culture and for education. That's all. Thank you. Sorry, because the time is that. But just to say one word, the final words, I am very aware that uh, uh, populism, nationalism, sovereignism uh, uh, are uh, some, uh, something very dangerous for the, project, the Euro project. And the, the, the more important, uh, uh, more important I I I issue and help that we can have is on rec reconnecting, as also Daniele said just before, with uh, our values, roots, and showing that identity and cultural diversity is the richness is not in conflict. And so to put the center of the project, culture, education dimension. Uh, second, FARO, FARO Convention, sorry, because for me, yeah, I'm very, very fond of FARO, I, so I'm fighting for this. This is another very uh, important thing that I hope that as a, a social democrat family, also at the national level, because I know that also in my country, they uh, is, is not anymore ratified, even if uh, is signed. That's important because FARO is another perspective to, to, to this right to cultural heritage of any citizen uh, to create these uh, heritage communities. That is another way to also consider museums, libraries, and others uh, also as a social uh, space and democratic space. Uh, another thing that I want just to underline is that uh, we put uh, in, uh, in the center and uh, we uh, strengthen also th um, thanking to, to Barbara and to Georgia for their um, commitment and also for their support as a rapporteur. But we want, I will propose to put in a first objective, general objective in cultural, in cultural, in creative, in creative Europe, uh, the intrinsic value of culture and art and also the role of artists and, and cultural operators and so on. Because uh, I imagine that we have to re-begin by this uh, recon recognizable, recognizable uh, role. Uh, you know that also we are very committed to understand uh, how we can strengthen the, uh, this uh, space, this area, this uh, sector. It's not only sector, in this case I can call it a sector, because audiovisual has already, uh, uh, we have already a literature and uh, data and figures, because we're also the observatory no, of audiovisual, but we have a lack of indicators of quality TV, qualitative indicators, not only quantitative, and also more uh, dedicated and more uh, tailored on these, uh, on these uh, matters. That's why we will insist to, to have a, a kind of observatory of creative and cultural in network with other excellence centers. Last words, resources. We are fighting for two um, important uh, um, objectives. First is, as I said before, uh, to cooperate with the parliament and the, and the accountants on the budget committee, uh, because it's already done in, in our uh, first resolution on the MMF uh, uh, programming to uh, not only to triple Erasmus, but to, to double Creative Europe. That's uh, the first thing. Uh, the second is that we are also trying, as I tried with the rapporteur, as rapporteur, in a, in a, in a um, dialogue with the Commission, to, with the GEAC, uh, because they want to don't lose what we um, ac achieve with the financial um, instrument, the new guarantee financial instrument, that is uh, in the, inside the 16 financial instruments dedicated to of, uh, loans, no? the guarantee, guarantee for uh, investment uh, at the national level, inside, within this uh, spectrum of 16 uh, different um, guarantee facilities, instruments, the, only in two years we have to recognize the, the, the guarantee for cultural creativity and so on, because we work a lot on this, to have a portfolio, dedicated portfolio, because a very sensitive uh, sector, et cetera, is the second as uh, um, results. Uh, now these uh, facilities will go inside the box of InvestU. But we want to preserve the, the, the specificity of this, of this uh, uh, financial instrument because it's not only, we want to not only grants, but also uh, rising up, uh, as someone asked, uh, the co 
financing, the range of co-financing, but also to, put the, 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 to, to have more opportunity to access to these guarantee facility, European guarantee facilities by investment European Bank, European Investment Bank, uh, uh, for uh, national uh, finance institutions that are in this moment for this uh, sector already 11. 11 institutions re respond to this. And so we are working, like, just to, 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 to share with you this uh, commitment, to uh, not, not, uh, not uh, uh, lose this, because we are, for us, not only investment uh, of resources, but also capability you know, to understand the, the, the needs, the special needs that these uh, so institutions, NGOs, uh, little SMEs, and so on, uh, in the cultural and creative sector has. Sorry, just to <laughs> inform you about this uh, specific question. Thank you for uh, your resistance, <laughs> and also to, have, to, for, to our panelists, to our interlocutors. Thank you for uh, to be with us in this, uh, in this fight. And thank you to Marco, because he's a very brilliant and patient moderator. Thank you. Just before we leave, just uh, take your voting cards and leave it on the table so we can use it in another event. But before you leave, I want you to ask you the last question. I think yeah. nobody, will, uh, nobody will die because of this. Just a moment. So let's go to our uh, most famous thing today. Uh, yeah, the last question. So let's get the phone so we close the... With, uh, with this one, yeah, with a nice collage. How did you like the conference? So you can write it, you don't vote publicly, you can say if you didn't like, you can also like, I didn't like it. And also thank you from, for, for, from my side, we apologize for not having so much time for discussion and for being late to the next group, to the next conference. You can write the name of your organization if you want to lobby, advocate, that's also fine. Too short, so the next time we should make like a, a whole day, not half day. Creative, uh, interesting, stimulating, informative, uh, 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 supper, uh, 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 yeah, great. Yeah. Erotic as well. We got a new, new terminology in the policy dialogue. So thank you very much from my side. I have a nice afternoon. Yes, yes, yes. I think we should speak, yeah. We have some common points.